All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is August 3rd, 2024. Oh, yesterday was my mother's birthday. Gave her a nice little Zoom meeting. She's all the way on the other side of the country from us. But it was nice to uh, see my mama and give her birthday wishes. I'm not going to say her age. She would be very upset with me. But happy birthday, mom. And, uh, well, brothers and sisters, <laughs> um, I've been trying to settle my heart for the last, and my spirit and my mind for the last few days. For anybody who's uh, part of Ministry Revealed in the forum, and when you hear me speak of it, you can come right here, ministryrevealed.com, click on it, and join us in the forum. Go to the, from the website, go to the menu, click on forum, it'll take you five, ten seconds to sign up. And it's like-minded brothers and sisters watching and praying, diligently seeking the Lord in this revelation that's been happening. That what we've called the open books, the revealing of the open books that have been kept secret. This, this opening of another layer within the scriptures from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation that have been opening up sh clearly showing us the revelation of the end of days. And today is another mind-blowing example of that. It is going to be hard at some parts. I can guarantee you it's going to be hard for some people to, to absorb. But I promise you, it's in the Word. It's in the Word. And this video, this teaching tonight, I had... For about the last, uh, well, not quite week, I knew when I was doing the last one in a fortnight, which was awesome, uh, preparing for people, right? We know this remnant being prepared, being revealed revelation to prepare them for the time of the end. This remnant group chosen from among the pre-trib who will remain to serve the Lord, be with them during 40 days, and serve him during seals. Well, I, I was planning, and I, I am tonight, going to do the video on the entire chapter of Revelation 12. Now, I've been redoing some videos with more details, right? Like the discourses, the complete seven churches, you know, the white horse rider, because we've added, not changed anything, but more revelation was given into the picture, into the understanding, greater depth of detail. Well, this one here in Revelation 12, is going to be no different. Um, and what I, I always pray, I'm always in prayer asking the Lord, you know, lead me, make, make known to me your will in Christ Jesus, in the revelation by the leading of the Holy Ghost. Use me, guide me, lead me, speak through me. And I do this, I mean, every day. I'm speaking to the Lord of these things. And, you know, it hasn't been disappointing, has it? It's been incredible to understand the revelations that have been taking place for almost seven years now. Almost seven years. It's just about 11, uh, six years and 11 months since the official. I mean, it started a few months before in June of 2017, but it officially began on September 8th, 2017. And, you know, <laughs> in this decision to redo an updated, a more detailed Revelation 12, I was praying for again, as I always do, for, for a greater picture, a greater revelation to understand as this process of revealing Revelation 12. And wow, 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 wow. Because what had happened was one of our sisters, Diane, she's just about, if almost always, the first person to watch the video when it begins on YouTube. And she always puts a little comment like, yay, or, you know, hello, or something like that. And she's in the forum, but she's not very active in the forum. And so when she posts, it catches my attention. And she posted about this pastor who, in this part five that she posted, um, it was really more about the sons of God. But the title of this video, of this teaching series that he did, was very, very interesting and our brother Olu went back and watched the videos. He told me I must start by watching uh, the second video and then go to the third and go from there. Because in the second one, he recapped some of the first. Well, 
I am so grateful for everybody who who helps, who who plays their part, who who has a piece here, who shares something there. Those who are praying for others, those who are fighting spiritual warfares, all of it over the ministry, over each other, over me and my family, and all of the ministry, because we are all playing a part. And this one was just a mind blower because we've spoken about it before. And I've explained to you guys many times, I have said, just imagine, because I posted, this is what I posted in the forum about three or so days ago when I realized what was being revealed. I was so freaking out. I posted in the forum, oh my goodness, hold on your hats, you guys. What's coming next is going to blow your minds. And here's the hint. The hint was, I've told you guys many times in teachings that can you imagine what is this going to look like that was the key that was the clue the hint that i gave and the reason i did that is so that people can can start to ponder start to prepare over it knowing maybe recognizing remembering where i've said that because this piece of scripture once we get to it these pieces of scripture and the the a couple of teachings because this is going to be a long one tonight guys this is going to cover some ground and we are going to spend some time in this revelation. Um, so I, obviously you guys already know how long it's going to be. I have no idea. But the we've often, we've understood it. We know that it's coming. But what I will guarantee most of you, if not all of you, have ever had is a picture in your mind as to what it is that we're going to see. What is it that we're going to see at that point? This is going to be something that has the whole world in a panic. Well, Scripture tells us, and, and eyewitnesses from which the first one, there's probably a number of you in the ministry, or at least a few of you in the ministry, who have heard of this. I've heard of this person before. I never really delved too deep into it. I just kind of thought, okay. Well, it was beyond okay because there was another story of other witnesses. And when I heard it, it just instantly clicked. Because there's a piece in the Apocryphas that I've shared on a number of times in Second Esdras. But there's one piece that I have purposely not spoken on within those verses of second Esdras because I couldn't wrap my mind around why it said that. Well, I understand it now. Oh, do I understand it now? And my goodness, you take a deep breath, prepare your minds, prepare your hearts, your spirits. Remember that by mid seals and then by mid trumpets, in the revelation of 14 years, how Mark's discourse tells us it's going to be a time worse than ever since the creation. And then Matthew's says it'll be worse than that ever in all of human history ever since that time, nor will ever be again after. Because Matthew's mid-trumpets portion will be worse. Well, this portion that I'm talking about isn't about it being worse. It's about it being beyond the imagination of what probably most, if not all of you, have been able to conceptualize in your minds. And I'm speaking of myself as well. That's why when I posted in the forum about it, I also mentioned that it's going to give you a picture. It's going to give you a picture in your mind's eye of what's coming at that time. <laughs> and it'll help you understand why in the revelations of what we taught comes after is going to happen <laughs> it's so crazy it's so awesome and i just want you guys to just settle your hearts and be ready because this is just going to be a wild wild ride all right so with that let me let me just start Actually, you know what? Yeah, let me just start where I normally do, which is the playlist. So if you're new to the ministry, you can go to ministryrevealed.com, go to the menu, click on intro series, or you can come to the playlist button right here and 
this intro series right here called the Intro to the End Times Revelation, watch the first four videos. You'll begin to understand what's being revealed here in this ministry. What is what the process and everything that has come to be revealed over the last almost seven years. This will begin with a 22-minute intro that'll give you little tidbits of what's coming in the next three. The second video is a 30-minute Bible study to introduce you to the revelation of what we call who the Gospels are speaking to. Everybody who has studied their scriptures knows that the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John as well, but specifically the Synoptics of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have had differences within the same story. Pastors have tried to just sidestep it or say it was just perspective. And there's some truth to that. In part, there's truth to that in the is. But in the revelation of the is to come is the mystery of understanding each and every single one of those differences. They're all prophecy. And that 30-minute intro will begin, will begin to give you some insight. For example, one that I always share. In Luke's gospel, before Jesus went to the cross, they arrayed him in a gorgeous white robe. Like, like a bride. It's called a, a, it's called a, a gorgeous robe. The definition in Greek is a white, beautiful, radiant robe. Sounds like a bride. In Mark's, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. Well, purple and scarlet are tribulation colors that the woman who rides the beast wears. Pretty wild, right? Well, when you understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the first will be last, the last will be first, Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end of days, goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. Once you start to understand this and you start to see it revealed in the scriptures themselves, your entire perspective will change. You will see and understand scriptures as you've never, ever understood them before. They will open to you in massive amounts of ways all over from the was, from creation to Christ, from the is, from Christ until the pre-trib and from the pre-trib until the end was, is and is to come will all begin to open to you. The third video is a 30-minute intro as to what this revelation of, of who the gospel speaks to reveals in the end of days. And what you'll come to understand is that the end of days is a period of 14 years. It's a period of 14 years and a small portion called above. This above portion is 50 days, and the 14 years are seven years of seals, and seven years of trumpets. Why wasn't this understood? Why wasn't this seen before? It wasn't yet the Lord's timing. He was using it to prepare a people for the time of the end. And when you get to the third, the fourth video, which is a big one, about two hours and 45 minutes, you will understand the answer is because we have all been taught foundationally from the Gospel of Matthew. And because we've all been taught foundationally from the Gospel of Matthew and only take a little bit from Mark to fill in blanks in Matthew and take even less from Luke to fill in blanks in Matthew, once you understand that they're speaking to different groups, you will begin to see what all of these differences in the Gospels reveal about the timing of each portion, pre, mid, and post. The pre begins at the start of the 50 days, right as the 50 days is about to begin, which is believed this year, August 12th, 2024, in the revelation of 70 years. Then after the 50 days, at the day and hour no one knows, at the Feast of Trumpets, the seven years of seals begin. Then you've got the seven years of trumpets, and it's all over, and it's the final jubilee. Once you begin to understand those four intro videos and pray over it seek him out search it see for yourselves that what i'm telling you is true because it's all read to you right there from the scripture then it'll all start to make sense man it's so you know we still i i still it's been almost seven years of this i still am 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 my mind is still blown. I, I can't believe I can I can conceptualize. I could see. I could I could I could do each of every one of these teachings without scripture in front of me. I could just go from here to there, the Greek, the Hebrew. I mean, it's it's wild. And I can paint that picture of the end of days through scripture. 
Well, tonight, that picture is start is going to come into 4D for you. HD color is coming, especially at this one specific period. It's so wild. But brothers and sisters, we know we're close, don't we? We're still in, what, nine days, right? Eight days and 15 or so hours to August 12th, 2024. 726 p.m. Jerusalem time, which is sunset. Just so happens to be 726 in the year of 70 coming to the end, in the year of the revelation of understanding when it begins and how it worked to get there. Awesome stuff. What do we know comes first, guys? The pre-trib? The pre-trib comes first, and at the moment of the pre-trib, Israel and Iran go at it, and a Middle East war breaks out with an attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv. Well, look what's happening, brothers and sisters. This is from the Jerusalem Post. Many people have been talking about it. Iran plans to attack Israel on Tish B'Av, the Jewish day of disasters, according to Western intelligence. Now, this has taken up a lot of time, like a lot of uh, juice on my laptop, so I'm going to close it. But why do I share that? Why was it shared with me in the forum? Because that is exactly when Scripture revealed exactly the start of the 50 days and the war that will break out in the Middle East as soon as the pre-trib bride of Christ has been taken out and a remnant group told to remain in their temple until he returns after the wedding on the eighth day. This is where they're planning their attack. Some people say, oh, no, they, they're not going to tell you when they're going to attack and say, oh, guess what, guys? Throughout all of Jewish history, this ninth of Av has always been a great day of attacks against them, a great day of removing them from their land, a great day of, of kicking them out of Europe. And they're now broadcasting this is the time of their attack. Man, it is heating up, brothers and sisters. It is heating up like crazy. Now remember, what as we get further into this, okay, what we're talking about isn't this portion right here. This is where it all begins. This right here, August 12th, depending where you are in the world, give or take, right? Right here is the beginning of it all. Right right here, right at this tail end, is the beginning of it all. For those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, it'll be in the above and 14 years ago. Where do they go? They are like a rapture. The word as one caught up, the word caught up is the Greek word 726 for harpazo, which is the Greek word for rapture. These guys are going to the third heaven, okay? They're going to the third heaven. They are, they are the Enoch types. What happened with Enoch? Enoch vanished. Enoch vanished. That's what's about to happen to tens of millions of people across the earth. The second part right here, this is the great multitude rapture of the was caught up into paradise. This is where we're going to spend a lot of focus time. This is going to blow your mind on this focus right here. Because we know of another person who didn't taste of death, and his name was Elijah. Enoch represents the pre-trib. Elijah represents the mid-trib, but specifically that remnant worker group who are the Elijah group sent out to serve the Lord during seals. What happened to Elijah? He was taken in a chariot, right? He went into paradise because he was taken in a chariot. I'm going to explain that to you as we get a little further down the road. When, when I share from this other pastor, I want you to know that if you decide to go and watch a bunch of his things, I want you to know ahead of time, I'm not in agreement with everything that he's talking about. Do I agree with a lot of his things? Yes, but 
you must understand, as I've watched his teachings, he does not believe in pre-trib or, or mid-trib. He believes it's all post-trib. Well, why does he believe in post-trib? Because like everybody else in Bible prophecy on earth, their foundation is, as I told you, from the Gospel of Matthew. And for those who believe there is no pre or no mid, but believe only in a post-trib, that study from Matthew's Gospel, they're the ones who are correct. I've said that before. For those who study from Matthew, which is everybody, and they say, no, there is no pre, there is no mid, it's only post, they're correct. They have understood the Gospel of Matthew in his discourse. The only problem is, like everybody else, they haven't understood Mark's and they haven't understood Luke's. Those are the mid and the pre. That's why the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. Just as it was in the first creation, second creation, and third creation. But that's for another topic. <laughs> okay? So, when do we know it all begins? We know it's all right here. It's right here. 70 to 80 years. But if you, if you can survive 70 to 80 years, that strength is labor and sorrow. The Hebrew definition there is pain, travail, toil, suffering. Right? It's tribulation. It's sorrow. It's all of those things. Which means what? From 70 to 80, that's 10 years of tribulation. What do most people tell you now? They say, well, 70 already passed in like 2017, 2018. So we're now, Israel, they just said they were 76, so we got four more years to go. No, nope. it's because they never understood how to count the 70 years. We're the only ministry that I'm aware of who consistently stuck with seeking and searching out the 70 years because we understood how important it was. The rest of the world seemed to see, to the rest of the Prophecy Watcher people and, and people in prophecy, including some of the pastors that talk on prophecy, they were all talking about 70 years to that point. But when it passed, they all stopped talking about it. We pursued it because it was clear that it was the revelation of the start of 14 years at the end of 70. We understood it from Leviticus 19. We understood it from accession and non-accession for the house of Israel compared to the house of Judah. We understood it. And it leads us to where we are right now in 2024. The last day of the 70th year is Elul 29, October 2nd of 2024, in the biblical revelation of 70 years from when they came into the land, as Leviticus 19 explained, with the revelation of the counting of the kings of the house of Israel and the house of Judah. When you understand that, you will clearly see with your own eyes and your own understanding we're in it right now. And this coming, uh, uh, sorry, in August 12th is the end to this, and then begins the above the 50 days before the 14 years. Crazy, wild, incredible stuff, guys. Well, let's get into Revelation 12 <laughs> and get ready to hold on tight. Hold on tight, because this one is going to be so powerful, so exciting. <laughs> Some of you might not be able to take it at first, but I promise you, if you've been following this ministry for any amount of time or for a reasonable amount of time, I've never lied to you. I've been wrong about when the things would start, but I've never lied to you. I've never spoken side truths and twists. I've never done any of that. I have only spoken the truth of everything in the revelation as I've understood it. And guess what? Did any of it change? Right? Did anything change since we started revealing the revelation of the Gospels? Or was it built on? The revelation of the 14 years and, and the big picture? Was, it any, was anything ever changed no matter who came against us? Or was it built on? The revelation of the, of the workers, the group that remains, their portion and, and what they get to be a part of, did it ever change or did it get built on? 
it never changed. No matter who or what tried to come against us, it never changed. So I want you to remember that as you start to hear, as we get to this, what is going to be revealed. Wild stuff, guys. So awesome. So let's start with Revelation chapter 12. Let me go to Revelation chapter 12. This, this is the program I use. This program called eSword, you can see it up here, eSword, was a major, major factor in the revelation. Of course, it's spirit-led. I couldn't understand. I couldn't retain all this. I couldn't do all of this in the revelation if it wasn't the will of the Father to lead me in the spirit to reveal the revelation of Jesus Christ. Impossible. This is one of the tools. This is called eSword. Maybe a few bucks a year, handful, maybe free, depending on the device you use. But you see, it has the definitions. The Greek and the Hebrew word definitions at your fingertips. And that is what explodes your understanding of the scriptures. It's absolutely incredible. I don't have any part in it, no piece, nothing like that. It's just a very powerful tool that I want you guys to understand. So listen how, let's start. Revelation 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, this, just about everybody believes, as I did back in the day, that this sign of Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, took place in September of 2017. I was saying since late September, middish late September of 2017, that it couldn't have been the event of 2017. And the reason it couldn't be is because of the definitions. It says in there appeared a great wonder. Listen to what it says. To gaze, that is with eyes wide open, at something remarkable, and thus differing from, which denotes simply voluntary observation. Okay? It's telling you that this is to gaze upon something remarkable, and that it's not simply just a voluntary observation, which expresses merely mechanical or passive casual vision. Okay? The Revelation 12 sign of, of 2017 was a voluntary observation, and it was literally mechanical and passive and casual. What's coming is something that's going to be gazed upon with eyes wide open as something remarkable. A great wonder in the heaven. Now, what I had considered in the past, because I was still, this was years ago, I was looking at this clarity within Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 21 in his discourse. That I used to always say that the pre-trib would happen between the end of verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2. I don't believe that, and I haven't been teaching that for a little while now. I believe the pre-trib is gone right here, right at the beginning of verse 1. Because what you're going to see, it says, and then appeared. So something so remarkable that people are going to notice. And then appeared a great wonder in heaven, right? This woman clothed with the sun, a crown of 12 stars. Well, if you go to Luke chapter 21 in his discourse, you see this picture. In Luke chapter 21, we come down here at the coming of the Son of Man. This coming of the Son of Man is not his coming pre-trib, okay? The pre-trib is down here, Luke 21, 36, when it says, Watch ye therefore and be accounted worthy, watch ye therefore and pray always to be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man, okay? To escape all these things that are being spoken about up here. But there's a remnant that remains. And when he returns from the wedding, he's meeting with this remnant. So what do we know happens while that wedding week is taking place in heaven? When that Enoch group, that pre-trib bride of Christ, that Gentile bride is taken. Like Romans 9 says, right? That in, in Hosea, uh, 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 that were not my people and her that was not my beloved shall be my beloved. This, this is while the wedding week is happening. The wedding week is happening. And as the Lord returns, as the Son of Man is coming to begin his 40 days, 
This is what's going to be seen, which I believe is Revelation 12, verse 1. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. And upon the earth, distress of nations. Well, clearly there's going to be distress because millions of people will have just vanished. And because of whatever this sign is, which is things that are coming upon the earth. With perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring and men's hearts failing them. Men are going to be, some men are going to be dying of heart attacks. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. Who's going to see him coming in a cloud as, a, as the white horse rider? His remnant workers. His remnant workers. When he's coming with power and great glory, and when these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. This is to the remnant workers. This is to those who are remaining to serve the Lord, who are waiting for when he returns as he instructed them, as we've covered many times. This is the expression of what we're seeing in Revelation 12.1. Does that mean September of 2017 wasn't a sign? Sure. It was the sign. And I believe the marker of the final 21 years that makes the final 22nd year, just like the Hebrew alphabet, the new beginning. It's over. It's, it's the final jubilee. It's the big picture of all of creation. It's the picture of the revelation of the end of days. Seven, what we would say, easy years while the Spirit is preparing the bride. This is during the wedding week. As the Lord's returning, during the wedding week and as the Lord's returning from it. And then look what we see. Revelation 12, 2. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, comma, and. We have a teaching on this from a long time ago called the comma and the revelation of comma and and I am no English major not even close my, I've told you guys the story in the past you know my wife used to get such a kick out of it she still giggles when I talk about this whole comma and thing because I like everybody else simply read through it like it was just and this you know like it meant nothing no it's a separation in addition to so if it's like I had one comma and one, that would equal two. But if I had one comma one, or say one comma two comma three, then that would just be one and then two and then three. But if I had one comma and two comma and three, that would be six. You see what's going on? The other one is like a count. It's one, two, three. The other one would equal six. And it makes a huge difference in understanding many parts and pieces of prophecy and this is one of them because we see right here this is where it all began for me in uh on uh september 8th of 2017 when this when all of the beginning of the revelation because i asked a question i noticed something and i remember chuck mister years ago saying if something catches your attention it's the spirit prompting you. So I thought, all right, guys, if there's anything to this, I'm going to go. I'm going to I'll let you guys know what comes of it. That moment right there changed the entirety of my life forever. And six months later, I was doing this full time as I've been doing now a little over six years. That was it. What was it? This is where it started right here. And she being with child cried travailing in birth comma and pained to be delivered well for those of you who have been around for a while you know exactly where this is going it takes us to isaiah 66 isaiah 66 verse 7 he says before she travailed before she travailed she brought forth which means what which means before, uh, where am I? Right here. Before the travailing. 
So if this is the travailing, then before the travailing, she brought forth. What is the brought forth? It's the pre-trib bride of Christ. Before the travailing, which means when everybody in the Revelation 12 world was talking about this being the rapture and being the pre-trib, it was not. Because Isaiah told us before she travailed, she brought forth, which is why I always said from the end of verse one to the beginning of verse two is the pre-trib. But with clarity over the years, I now know the pre-trib is here. This is the week of events that are going to take place. And then here comes the son of man. The son of man is the 40 days of travailing. And we see it right here. So we have before she travailed, she brought forth. That's the pre-trib. And then listen to what it says. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. Now, what's before the pain? What came before the pain? Travailing. This travailing is a representation of the 40 days of the Son of Man, which comes before the pain. This travailing represents the Son of Man coming for 40 days as his birth, but not exactly on the date of his birth, but about two months after, as we have revealed in the scriptures. From Isaiah 9 to Matthew 4, in realizing when John was finally put in prison, when Jesus fulfilled it, after the light affliction in two northern Israel cities, which is how the end will play out with Haifa and Tel Aviv, on around the 12th to the 13th after the pre-trip happens. You see, while the wedding is happening in heaven, and this stuff, craziness is going on from these, this sign and wonder and the sun, moon, and stars, Israel is also breaking out in war in the north. Just like we showed, they've, they've told for the ninth of Av, the great day of destructions. This has always represented the 40 days of the Son of Man. She brought forth a man-child. That is the picture of Luke chapter 2, of Isaiah chapter 9, for unto us a child is born. It is the picture of Christ coming to begin his 40 days. And then what happens? When his 40 days are over, then the pain begins. What is this pain? What have we, what have we broken this down in the past to show you? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 12 in Esword. And look at this word for pained. Torture, pain, toil, torment, vex. It's tribulation. It's the beginning of tribulation. What is this beginning of tribulation? It is the attack that comes at the day and hour no one knows to begin the 14 years this time when Syria comes at the end of 50 days, and it'll be Syria and those with Syria that bring the great affliction, and that is going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. Jews, it'll be, the many will be killed. They'll flee to the mountains. That's why the Son of Man was here for 40 days to warn them about what's coming as he said he would, as Jonah did. And when he's gone, there's three days and then the anointing of that remnant group of Noah's, that, that remnant Elijah company being prepared, who are serving the Lord, will then be waiting for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost on day 50, they go out from Jerusalem, just like Luke's discourse explained. From that point forward, bang, the compassing about that will have taken place for a few days, three days or so in Jerusalem by Syria and all of them, the attack will take place, and the pain, the pain, toil, torture, all of that begins the 14 years of tribulation. What is this pain? Well, it's Mark's, It's the first portion of Mark's discourse. It's right here. It begins with the red horse rider. Remember, in Luke's discourse, we see that he's warning, right? Like he said he would. Warning for them to flee and when they see themselves compassed about. That's the Son of Man here. Warning like he said he would. 
And then when his 40 days are over, the three days, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, they go out from Jerusalem. Then the red horse rider has been released. Peace is taken from the earth. He gives them a great sword that they should kill one another, which is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In Luke's discourse, it says, then said he unto them, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and all these things. But then what did it say? Then in verse 12, he says, but before all these. That's, that's, that's the revelation right there of the 40 days being discussed after the pre-trib happens, the Lord returning from the wedding, and then you have the but before all these. It's the 40 days picture of the Son of Man and him warning. And those that are there with them, serving them, some putting their necks on the line for them. Then the 14 years begin. The 14 years, beginning with the destruction of Jerusalem, then breaks out to World War III. That, that word pained, that word pained right here, is a description of the first two and a half years of tribulation. The first two and a half years of tribulation. Remember in the in the Psalms 90 and 10, it said sorrows, right? Travail, sorrow, pain. This is going to last what? This right here that we're going to read briefly or take points from it is going to last two and a half years. So nation against nation, World War III breaking out, starting at Jerusalem, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, um, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles, which is roilings of water, major water disturbances. These are the beginnings of sorrows. The beginnings of sorrows. What? How, uh, we got to wrap our minds around that. The beginnings of sorrows? World War Three is the first two and a half years of tribulation with all of these things, and right here, but take heed to yourselves, right? They're going to take you up to councils, those who are coming to Christ, that remnant worker group. You're going to be betrayed by brethren and family and friends. All of this right here, from verse 8 to verse 13, is the first two and a half years of tribulation that Revelation 12 calls pained, and that Mark's discourse says is the beginnings of sorrows. It is two and a half years. Could you imagine? The first two and a half years of tribulation are called the beginning. And it's World War III. We can't wrap our minds around World War III, really. Not fully. Imagine that being called just the beginning. Wow. Now look what happens. Now look what happens. Revelation 12, 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. That's another, that's another event coming. That's another something in, in, this, in the heavens that's going to have people saying, what? Not so much that it causes them to go run and hide, but so much that it causes them to say, oh my goodness, what is coming? What is this? Well, we know what it is, don't we? We know what it is. It's Revelation 12, uh, uh, sorry, it's um, Mark 13, when it says, but when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not. This means to place something where it shouldn't be. And during the time of seals, we all know that the flesh that we're in is still the temple of God. Now, let me let me make a, a, a note here and something I'm going to say, and I want you guys to remember it. I want you to remember it. Is. Are we not all spiritual beings from 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 the beginning of creation to the very end is not has not everybody actually been a spiritual being covered in these flesh suits? <laughs> My daughter gets kicked out of that. She's like, what flesh suits? 
But that's the truth, isn't it? We are all spiritual beings temporarily here in these flesh suits. When these flesh suits are over, we go back to spirit. Right? Do you not think other beings do that too? Of course they do. We've been told they do in scripture, right? We don't know if we're entertaining angels when we're with people. We know that Michael and Gabriel went to some of the old prophets. You see? Because there's some here among us, there's there's some, you know, from the spiritual. It's because we're all spirit beings temporarily covered in these flesh suits. So, I want you, that's just like a little sidebar thing that I want you to remember when we get into these deeper things. Listen to what it says, okay? So we know that if here we are in the midst of seals, about two and a half years in the seals, you'll notice in the first two and a half years, I call it about the first half of, of seals, this two and a half years that takes place, there's no false Christ and no false prophets. There's no antichrist. There's no beast yet. They haven't been given the power and the authority yet. Until what? Till about the midpoint, which is about two and a half years. And the temple is still, we're still in the age of the Gentiles until the end of seals. Which means the this abomination being placed where it ought not is the mark of the beast. Well, look who just showed up. We just saw in verse 3, the red dragon showing up in heaven. Where are they going to see this, guys? They're going to see it by looking up in space, right? Looking up in, into the heavens. That's where it's going to be seen. So something above is going to be seen. And its connection is this right here of Mark's abomination of desolation, for which it tells us, for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. Matthew's is different, okay? We can't really grasp what this means. But we just got a little picture of the time frame of what's about to be seen. The great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns? We know when he's taking that power. We know when that's coming, right? That about two and a half years in. It's just like in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, what do we have? We have the lion. We have the bear. We have the leopard. And then we have the fourth beast. The lion, the leopard, and the bear, or the lion, bear, and leopard, what are they? They're the same period of time as Mark's portion right here of the first two and a half years of tribulation with World War III. It's this, this portion of these three right here and them and their battles back and forth is the same as the word pained of Revelation chapter 12 that equals the two and a half years. Because when this wonder comes, this wonder is going to give power and authority to who? Oops, where did I go? It's going to give power and authority to the fourth beast. The fourth beast. This is the beast of Revelation. After this, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. This is the this is the crushing, the killing of the Gentiles. And it was diverse from all the other beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. If we go to Revelation chapter 13, we get more of a description of it. This is that fourth one. We see him right here, uh, having ten horns. And upon his horns, uh, ten crowns, and the name of blasphemy. Okay, so he had what? Seven heads and ten horns. And the beast was like unto a leopard. His mouth was like a lion. 
You see? So he he has uh, um, the body of the leopard. He has the feet of the bear. He has the mouth of the lion. So when he comes, what does he do? He takes the power that these guys had, these first three had during World War III. And they now all, essentially you could say, submit to him. He takes over as the beast of Revelation. When does that take place? About two and a half years into the 14 years of tribulation. That's why you saw here in Marks that there was no beast, no false prophet, right? No antichrist, no false prophet in the first two and a half years during World War III. Why? Because they want to bring the world to its knees. Because if they can bring the world to its knees, then when he comes on stage, once he's revealed and has this power and authority, the world will be crying out for him who haven't come to Christ. Many will understand and will flee from him and will accept Christ still during that time. But you see, there is going to be what? What, what was happening? Famine. Earthquakes, World War III, troubles, roilings of water. People are going to be dying in the streets of starvation, of lack of water, in war. That by the time he makes his appearance and gets his power to continue for 42 months, people will be primed to receive him because they will be seeking for anybody. But those in Christ are those that come to Christ at the, during the seals. There's no way they will understand. What do you think the remnant workers are going to be doing? They're going to be waking people up and bringing in the greatest multitude, working to bring in the great multitude rapture, to wake people up in the greatest revival in human history in the midst of the greatest chaos <coughs> of war since the world began. And that's only World War Three. What happens? When the mark of the beast comes, when he gets his power, when he comes as the beast and gets that power, he's going after the Christians. It's going to be a time worse than ever before. What time do you think this is going to be? It's going to be the time of about Passover. It'll be about Passover of 2027. Well, lo and behold, Moses when, when you understand that the John the Baptist workers, that remnant group, there's a Moses type and there's the Elijah company type, that there's two groups working. What was the picture prophetically with Moses at Passover? To flee them, to take them into the wilderness. This is what's about to take place here. At the time of Passover, two and a half years into tribulation. Now, why? Because it's the time of the mark of the beast, and look who shows up. Now you've got the commentary, or the, the words, of false Christs and false prophets now showing up. You see, in the first half, there was no false Christs and false prophets. But at the abomination of desolation, the time of the mark of the beast, there's false Christs and false prophets. When? At the same time of the appearing of the great red dragon. Because it's the great red dragon who is going to give power to the beast who takes over the authority from the leopard, the bear, and the lion. Listen to what it says, verse 2 of Revelation 13. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Hello. We just saw and understood when the dragon was appearing and when he's going to give him his power and his authority. And what do we know happens at this time? Um, nobody will be, right, uh, uh, which gave power unto the beast to worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And then it says, verse 5, Revelation 13, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. So was he here? Of course he was here. But was he in the authority as the beast? No. Just like the false prophet. Of course, the false prophet would have to probably be here now. But it, was he yet come into authority? No. This 42 months begins in... Let me go to one of the charts. This 42 months 
begins at Passover of 2027, about two and a half years into tribulation. When he gets this power to continue for 42 months, it's going to equal what? 42 months will be three and a half years. Those are the three and a half years, the 42 months that he gets. But we saw false Christ and false prophets. So what about the false prophet? Well, he comes up at the same time too. In verse 11 of Revelation 13, you see, actually, if you, we don't need to go into all of it, but we see once he's given this power to continue for 42 months, it says that it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindred and tongues and nations. You see? And all they that dwell on, upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So people that want to point the figure and say, hey, they're the Christians, go after them, will go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword will be killed with the sword. There's no killing for us. Can you defend? I'm sure you could defend, but not killing. Here is the patience of the saints. You see? Because this is the time now when they go after them. This is why Mark's discourse in the fleeing into the wilderness at that point. But who's here with them? Well, we need a false prophet, right? There has to be a false prophet here with them. And there is. Revelation 13, 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke and, and spake as a dragon. He exercises all the power of the first before him, which causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. We've got a great video teaching on this. This deadly wound that was healed had to do with the seven horns and the eighth coming up from the seventh. Okay? He is the eighth who has come up from the seventh. So he is the seventh who's become the eighth, meaning he's coming from the same place where the seventh was, and he's the eighth. That's the deadly wound that was healed. We've got incredible revelation on that, great teaching from the book of Revelation and going into Daniel 7 and 8. And then look what it says. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image unto the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live, and he had power to give to the be give uh, uh, power to the beast so that it could speak. And what happened? They're to take the mark or to worship him or his image or his name and so forth, right? This is, most people understand this, this is the false prophet. Let me, to help you out, for those that don't know, I'll show you that it is truly the false prophet. Because when the Lord returns, and he comes, uh, um, actually, we can go into 19. At the very end, when he returns feet down, and he brings that final judgment, that final battle, we see that in verse 19 of Revelation 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet. Which means the false prophet is that beast out of the earth that we read about in Revelation 13. And the evidence is right here. That brought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark and so forth. So it's not a mystery to say that the second one who comes out of the earth is the false prophet. So right, right here and what we're seeing in all of this is this period of time when the beast gets his 42 months to continue. These 42 months that he has to continue are in Revelation chapter 12 from right here. From verse 3, when the dragon is going to give him his power at the end of the pain, at two and a half years in, this other wonder is going to be seen. And he's going to give authority to the beast to now continue with his authority for the next 42 months. 
this 42 months, we've also explained it for you in Revelation chapter 17 in other teachings. It's so beautiful once you understand it. It directly lines up with the discourses. Just as we saw in the first half of Mark's, there was no false Christ or false prophets. In Luke's, there was no false Christ or false prophets. But in the second half of Matthew's, uh, of Mark's, there were false Christ and false prophets. Okay? That's because that is the period that he gets when he's going to be there for 42 months. So when you come to Revelation, we see it right here. Okay? Um, talking about the beast with seven heads and ten horns. In Revelation 17, 8, it says, The beast that thou sawest was, was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. We'll cover that later. The 42 months was the was. At the end of his 42 months, which is the end of the sixth year of seals, you're going to see that he's going to be killed. And so for that seventh year of seals in the first half of trumpets, he is not until the time comes of ascending out of the bottomless pit and going into perdition. Okay? Now remember, the, the dragon is a wonder in heaven. The dragon hasn't been cast down to the earth. But the dragon is still giving at this point his authority to the beast. And this is the same timing that we're seeing here. This is when the beast gets that authority. And he's going to continue for 42 months until the end of the sixth year of seals. What do we see then at the end of the sixth year of seals? Okay. It says, let's go to, let's go do it this way. Let's go to Mark's Discourse, chapter 13, and watch what it says. 13, starting in verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, you see? After that tribulation that just happened. Not all of tribulation, but that tribulation. It says... The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a, nope, not in a anymore, but in the clouds with power and great glory. Listen to this. And then shall he send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Okay? So you're seeing something happening just before the Son of Man is seen coming somehow. Well, what if we go to Revelation chapter 6? In Revelation chapter 6, we see... In verse, uh, in the sixth seal, look at what we read. Verse 12. And, oh, actually, look at before verse 12. Look at before. You got those who are being killed, right? A fifth, a third, a, a, a quarter of the earth, right? A fourth of the part of the earth being killed. And then I opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls, the souls of them that had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Remember, that's, that's exactly what we were talking about in Revelation chapter 13, right? This is the patience of the souls. They've been given, the, the enemy has been given power over them, and he's going to be killing them. He's going after them. If that's that time, it'll be worse than it ever was since creation. And now look, in, look at what verse 6, uh, the 6 seal is. Revelation 6, 12. And I beheld, and when he opened the 6 seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, as uh, even as a fig tree casts her early figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. 
That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That sounds really, really familiar. After that tribulation. After that tribulation. What do we know about this period of time as well? Okay? We know that just like Revelation 6 said, this is happening just before in the same order as Mark's discourse. It describes these things in Mark's discourse before what? Before the coming of the Son of Man. Before the coming of the Son of Man. So now look what happens in verse 16 of Revelation 6. It says, actually it's starting verse 15. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Precisely, when you see what we're going to get into here, who shall be able to stand is an understatement. You're about to understand why they went hiding in the rocks and mountains and in the earth and everywhere else to hide from what's coming. It is going to blow your mind, as it did mine. I had to settle myself several times over the last few days and even pause for half an hour before going into the teaching tonight. Because it's, <laughs> it's a wild picture that's going to be in your mind's eye. So what do we know where we are now in relation to Revelation 12? Look at this. And his tail drew a third of the stars and did cast them to the earth. <laughs> Are you seeing a pattern? You seeing it? This is that, that sixth seal towards the end of the sixth year. And the dragon stood before the woman which was to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And then it says, and she brought forth a man child. What was he to do? who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now this ruling all nations with a rod of iron, you'll notice, is before the was caught up. Remember what the was caught up is? The was caught up is the second group, the mid-trib great multitude rapture that goes to paradise. All right? So, where, uh, uh, what did it, did it, so, lost my train of thought. So, what we're seeing here is this same, oh yeah, I was in 12. What we're seeing here is this timing of the coming of the Son of Man, just as it's described in Revelation 6, when he's going, and it says what? To rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up. So after he comes, then you see there's going to be a was caught up. And what does it say? To rule with a rod of iron. Well, let's follow this story. This story we know very well. When we go to the Ministry Revealed book, the story on the seven churches, what do we know about the seven churches? We know we're right here. We're coming to the very tail end of the Laodicean age. The moment the pre-trib starts, that takes place, the seven churches play over again, starting with Ephesus at the beginning of the 50 days of the pre-trib. Well, when the Lord returns, what is this? This is the beginning of the 50, the first week. This is then the 40 days with the Son of Man. Both of these groups are remaining to serve the Lord during seals. Then you've got the beast. This is where you got the beast and the false prophet. We did a great teaching on this not too long ago, the one I showed earlier with the seven churches. Because at Pergamum is when you see where Satan's seed is, and then you get Balaam and Balak. One is the king and one is the false prophet, right? One is the beast, one is the false prophet. Right where it should be. 
right where it should be, which is the prophetic type of Constantine and exactly Mark's discourse when they fled into the wilderness. And then what? Then they're still in the wilderness. Period of dark ages in that second half of seals. That three and a half years fleeing from the beast, right? Until what? Until the very end of Thyatira. Because Sardis is the beginning of the seventh year of seals. But guess what? When did we see the beast? Uh, sorry, when did we see the Lord coming? Did we see the Lord coming at the, at the end of the sixth year? Or just before it? Just before the end of the sixth year is over. Just before the end of the sixth seal, he's seen coming. Which means he's going to be seen coming and this event taking place right at the moment towards the end of the sixth year. Which is exactly why, when we've shown this to you before, in relation to the incredible story, we did a recent teaching on this as well, with what comes before the transfiguration story. You see? It's like verse 9 of Mark. Before he comes, after six days, or after six years, what would that be? The seventh year, at the start of the seventh year. Or seventh day. You see? So what do we see? They will have seen him come with power. They will have seen the kingdom of God come with power. That's Revelation 6. That's them seeing what's coming right here. And it's before the end of the sixth year of seals. Sardis is the beginning of the seventh year of seals. This reformation, this time when, when the great multitude will be brought in in the seventh year of seals. Well, what happens if we go read Thyatira, the end of Thyatira, to get a picture and see if Thyatira, the end of it, is really a prophetic picture of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. Well, look at what it says. Unto Thyatira, Tyra, <coughs> write these things, saying, The Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flaming fire, and his feet are like fine brass. We get that same prophetic picture, don't we? We get it in... Well, we get it in Daniel chapter 7, which we saw earlier. If you continue to the beast when his time is over, then you see when the cast, the, 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 I beheld in Daniel 7, 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient days did come, uh, whose garment was white as snow, his wheels, fiery flame, wheels, burning fire. Do you understand what's going to be seen, guys? This is what they're seeing coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. What on earth is it? Well, we know what it is, right? But in relation to Revelation 12, it's the time of him coming to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So if Thyatira has been understood, we should be able to see the end of the sixth year picture being the time of Thyatira and see what he has to say, having come as, whoops, having come as the one with, Eyes like a flame of fire and feet as fine brass. Well, look what comes at the end of Thyatira. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall, uh, shall they be broken to shivers. So when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, he's coming to rule with a rod of iron. And the first thing he's going to do is what? Destroy those that come against them. Break them into shivers. Right? Like a potter. Well, where do we get this exact picture? In Daniel chapter 2. We get the image of the beast, right? It says, The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of brass, um, his legs of iron and his feet, part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone was cut 
out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay and break them into pieces. Do you hear the everything's the same? It all ties together. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away and there was no place for them and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is a story we've spoken about before, right? This coming Mount Zion, the mountain of the Lord is coming and i have told you guys numerous times which was the hint in the post in the forum what on earth can that possibly end up looking like where is this thing coming from how is it going to come from a spiritual realm in heaven when it's a physical thing of a mountain that's going to be seen by everybody that has them in an absolute freaking out panic Hello. What else is this time? Well, of course, it's Ezekiel 39. This is the Ezekiel 39 war, right? We know in the Gog Magog, when they all gather to come together to fight against them, this is the Ezekiel 39 war that happens at the end of the sixth year of seals. Well, check this out. In our chapters to years that reveal the end of days, where is it? Chapter 39. Chapter 39 is the sixth year of seals, and the prophetic picture of it is the latter portion, that very end of the sixth year of seals, when they all see him coming before the very end of the sixth year. Right? He's coming right near the tail end of it. And then, boom, the seventh year starts, which will be Ezekiel chapter 40. Oh, that'll be something you're going to want to remember, but we'll get to it. Now, we saw this also. We just spoke about this. They're going to see it before the end of the sixth year. And you guys will remember, we've spoken about this before. I want you to see how long ago. Hi there, everyone. It's Sage Robbins. Oh, here, let me play. And it's Tony Some Robbins. of these things tonight, guys, I'm sorry, Hi, this is going to be commercials, but we'll just have to we check it out. They're just a few seconds. I'm across most of this. Okay. I want you to see this. This is a video I did called the most important end time video you'll ever watch watch it now i this was a video i've i've spoken about it over the years and i've used it as a reference to just being so in awe with the revelation of it that i i, I, I was freaking out you have to remember for the first year year and a bit i was crying i was in tears every week because I couldn't comprehend what, what was happening to me. I, I didn't understand how I, how I was knowing where everything connected. And, and instantly I would read it. And I knew it went somewhere else. And this went to there. And I'd never read those scriptures before. I barely opened my Bible, sadly enough. And yet I was understanding these things. I was a mess. So you could imagine when this video came. This video I did May 11th, 2018. Shortly after, in April, when I got the revelation of the chapters to years of 14 chapters in Hosea, 14 chapters in Zechariah, and they related to the 14 years from the world perspective and from the, from the Jewish perspective. The end of days is revealed in them. Well, this was May 11th, 2018. We have known and understood this for over six years that the Lord at the end of the sixth year of seals is seen coming with Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion, brothers and sisters? <clears throat> well, without deviating too far off, off track, if we go to the creation story, for those that have been following for a while, we know that the gap theory is the first creation and it was the Spirit. It was the Spirit of God, right? It is those who are in Christ's Spirit filled, those going pre trib is connected to them. Then it was the creation in the days that began when the Father made Jesus the light. 
this is the light of Jesus. That's why John chapter 1 says John wasn't that light, but he bore witness of that light. Because John was a part of the spirit group. Hence, remember, he, he had the spirit from birth. He was the witness to the light. Jesus is the light. Jesus was this light in Genesis 1 verse 3. And this began the creation of days. The creation of days are a picture of what? The seven years of seals. And then in the seventh day, right, is the, day, is the rest. And then what happened? Then you had when he formed man, and where did he place man? He formed the flesh, right? Spirit, light, flesh. Where did he place the flesh? In the beginning of the thousands of years that began with Adam. You see? Where did it start? In the garden. In the garden of Eden, <coughs> which is called paradise, right? We all know the garden of Eden is paradise. Well, when does it start? If the seven days of creation are a picture of the seven years of seals, then that means when he's coming at the end of seals, he's coming with the Garden of Eden. He's coming with paradise. Exactly as it said he would do to receive these people into paradise. He's coming with paradise. He's coming with Eden. And we have understood this for six years. And it was so powerful back then. It's crazier powerful as you're going to witness tonight. It's far more powerful than, than the, the basic picture we probably had in our mind's eye. Because I've always just explained it as Mount Zion coming, paradise coming. And I've always told you guys that it's just, what is this going to look like? Right? You know, we've heard of ships, you know, things. But where is it? W where is it coming from? It's going to look like a great mountain flying in space. That's what it's going to look like. Well, don't forget, we were already told in Daniel chapter 7, this, this imagery as well. Like a fiery flame in his wheels as burning fire. <laughs> Something wild is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, which is why they're all going into the caves and rocks freaking out. So now let's let's take this forward a bit more. We know what's going to happen, right? We know that when he comes at this point, we know that he he's still in the was, right? At this point of the was, which is the 42 months, right at the end of the was, which is his 42 months, what's going to happen? Well, let's go see. It says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These shall have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb. When is the war coming against the Lamb? At the end of the sixth year of seals, it is the Ezekiel 39 war. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him. Oh, man. <laughs> and they that are with him. Maybe we'll just let that absorb for a second. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay? So, at the end of the six year of seals, there's going to be armies of people gathering together to come and fight them when they see this mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion, paradise, coming. And we even saw from Revelation chapter 2, that very tail end portion is the picture like 
Revelation chapter 12. When he comes with when he's going to rule them with a rod of iron. So after he defeats these enemies, he is going to rule with a rod of iron. Well, when you go to the seven churches, what do we know comes next? Sardis, the church reformation, the period of Israel's kings. This is important <clears throat> because who's the king? Who is the king of Israel? Jesus. Who, who's, who's coming with Mount Zion, with paradise, with the Garden of Eden? Who's coming? The king. The king. At a time of reformation, this is the gathering of the great multitude mid-trib rapture. Those who are still alive. I believe it'll be over 1.2 billion people in the mid-trib great multitude rapture, of which the majority will have survived. Maybe a few hundred million dead, but the majority will have made it through and will go in the great multitude rapture, never having tasted of death, just as it said in Mark's portion, when they will have seen him coming first at the tail end, <coughs> and then this is that beginning of the seventh year of seals, the beginning period of, listen carefully, Israel's kings. It's going to be Israel's king. I want you to remember this. We're going to get to it later on after all the videos. It's also the period that is equivalent to Second Kings. Remember the exodus and the, the, the espousals that it equals, the wedding? Then the wanderings of the 40 days, and then tribulation and, and the, the first two and a half years. Then you've got the, 36 month, uh, the 42 months, which is the wanderings time in the wilderness, till the Lord is seen coming at the very end, destroys them. And then it's the seventh year of seals, the period of Israel's kings. And it also equals in that seventh year, second kings, which I'm going to show you later, connected to these videos that I'm going to share, that are go it's going to blow your mind. Remember, he's coming with paradise. Then he will, they will seal the 144. And the great multitude rapture will be taken exactly as Scripture foretold us to paradise. Okay? So, what do we know from Mark 13? <clears throat> what is this period in Mark 13? Of course, we covered that part there. When is this coming of the Lord? Well, it says, but of that day and hour knows no man. So if, it's, if the 14 years begins on the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, and the Lord is coming and is going to be seen before the very end of the sixth year, when they see him and he's going to destroy the enemies, you're going to see how and what he's coming on and where he's coming from. Oh, man, that it's before, like Mark said, right? It's before he's seen coming. And then after he's destroyed them, right? After he's destroyed the enemies, the, the 10 kings and the beast, who is part of now the was, it'll be after six days or six years in the prophetic, which means it's the beginning of the seventh year. So in Mark's discourse, the day and hour no one knows is what? the Feast of Trumpets of the beginning of the seventh year of seals or the seventh year of tribulation. Hello. It's not a mystery once you can track it, guys. So now, when the, when the seventh year starts, he has destroyed the enemies at the end of the sixth year of seals. What happens? Well, it begins with the sealing of the 144,000, and then there's your great multitude rapture. The great multitude rapture and the 144, look at where the 144 are standing, brothers and sisters. Revelation 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. There's your 144,000 with the lamb on Mount Zion, paradise, the place he came with. 
this is in the physical, brothers and sisters. This is something in the physical, brothers and sisters. It is going to be seen. Oh, it's going to be seen. And I believe the timing of the leading of the Spirit for this revelation that's coming about, this understanding that though it maybe have been understood as to where it is, what it is, and so forth, nobody had our revelation, the revelation of Scripture, of the Gospels in 14 years to understand it, its timing. But for us, it is so powerful for a group being prepared to understand this so that they will understand these things ahead of time. Be aware of it and not be caught off guard by these things. And the timing that this so happens to be revealed for us in the last two teachings that are coming, I believe it was absolutely divine leading of the Spirit in the will of the Father for this time to prepare us. Because this might have been difficult to accept for many if it wasn't so late. Because you're going to start to get this picture very clearly. Remember the great multitude rapture? Remember what we said, you know, in the chapters to years? We just saw the perfect timing of Ezekiel 39. Well, what if we go to John? If we go to the Gospel of John, 21 chapters for the big picture of 21 years, chapter 14 is also the seventh year of seals. What happens in the seventh year of seals? What happens in the seventh year? Well, in John's Gospel, it's chapter 14. <clears throat> we go to chapter 14, and what did the Lord tell them? In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now listen to the words carefully. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. <coughs> Excuse me. That where I am, there you may be also. He's gone to prepare a place and come again. And receive them to himself that where they are, that where he is, there they may be also. This is paradise, brothers and sisters. This is paradise. Remember when he's going to receive them to himself? We've seen this in uh, Jeremiah 31, right? When you go into Jeremiah 31, it is it's incredible when you use the uh, Septuagint, the original translation. It says, "Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and." And with them, the blind and the lame and the woman with child and her that travail with child together, a great company. This is a great multitude. The word company also means multitude in the Hebrew. But in the Septuagint, it tells us at Passover. Now, I believe it will be second Passover because that's the unfulfilled one. I believe it will be second Passover because there will have been so many dead and because they're coming from such a far distance that there's going to be that additional time. Now, yes, there's the rapture, but there still is other things connected in it as well. So we know because of the second wheat harvest, which is called the spring wheat, which is harvested in the fall, but can't be observed or used until spring of the Passover of the following year. We know that the great multitude rapture is going to happen at about the sixth, most likely seventh month of the seventh year of seals which again if you go to ezekiel 39 you will understand why it says they'll be bearing bones for seven months they're bearing bones for seven months if they were near any deadly thing right they, they need that additional month it equals seven months after the ezekiel 39 war it's all there for us right so again we go back to John. It's all connected to this time of paradise. So everything that we're talking about right now <clears throat> is this period of time right here. Right here. Revelation 12, verse 5. This period right here of Revelation 12, verse 5 is we're going we're gonna to be spending a lot of time here. 
We're going to be spending a lot of time. This is all about, as we saw, him coming at the end of the sixth year, destroying the enemies, and then what is he going to do? He's going to rule with a rod of iron, right? He's going to rule with a rod of iron. We know that in the seventh year of seals, the great multitude rapture are the ones that are going to the place prepared of paradise. We know from Jeremiah that it truly is at about Passover, second Passover, in the seventh year of seals. So about seven months after he, the, he had been seen and came in the clouds. Okay? What we're going to talk about and reveal is this coming of him in the clouds. You see, if you remember Mark 14, we've shown this. In fact, I'm going to go to it here in Mark's gospel. It was another great teaching of revealing the differences in the gospels. When you go to Luke's discourse and Mark's discourse and Matthew, or sorry, in Mark, Luke's gospel, Mark's gospel, and Matthew's gospel, you'll notice the differences. So in Luke's, you see that it's similar, but definitely different. And we see here in Mark uh, 14, 15, it says, and he will show you a large upper room, okay, above the ground, an upper room above the ground, okay, upward, top of, and it's only used twice. That's because the first time it's used in Luke, because Luke's group and Mark's group are both takings. One goes to the third heaven and one is going to paradise. It's just like it's just like this here. We've spoken about this, right? From the Apocrypha fragments. But there is a distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold, those who produce sixty, and those who produce thirty. For the first are taken into the heavens. The second class will be dwell in paradise. And the last will inhabit the city. Right? That's even in the Apocryphas. It is the revelation, as we have understood it, from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. First group going to the third heaven, second group going to paradise, which is what? A taking, a taking, and the third time he's coming to them. They're getting the city, you see? So when we go here now into Mark 14, the first one was the taking of Luke's. The second one is the taking in Mark's. But there's a difference in Mark's besides that that is very interesting because Luke's says furnished. Only Mark's says furnished and prepared. Remember what John, 15, uh, John 14 said? That when I, where I go, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. He's coming with the place prepared. And that's where he's going to receive them to. He's going to receive them into paradise. But this paradise is coming. It is coming. And it said his angels are coming with them. All of them? No, a group of them are coming. Let's see another connection. How about Joel chapter 2? Joel chapter 2 is another mighty one for us in this revelation. Because what do we know about Joel chapter 2? Well, we know from the book of Joel, we have a video, a teaching on it, that talks about the pre, mid, and post of chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. And what have we shown you from this? Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm in my holy mountain. In my holy mountain. A day of darkness and of gloominess, of thick clouds and darkness. And the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath not ever been, there have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even after the years of many generations. So he's coming with his mountain, and on his mountain is a great people strong. Whoa. Look at what it says. A fire devours before them, and behind them a burning flame. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. We've taught this is the end of the sixth year, right? 
that end of the sixth year going in to the start of the seventh year of seals. All right? Children of Zion, the former rain, latter rain, right? That was so wild. And now look what happens after Mount Zion is seen. The trumpet is blown. The mountain is now coming. Once he has destroyed them, then what do you get? The floors will be full of wheat because it is the mid-trib great multitude rapture of the spring wheat. And I will restore unto you the years, right? We've shared this in the previous one. It says in verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. You see, because during seals, you don't need the baptism and everything else. It's just repentance and remission of sins, right? You need to have faith. So you can cry out on the name of the Lord. Remember what happened in Luke, I think, 22? Yeah, in Luke 22, the thief on the cross, maybe 23, there was the thief on the cross on the right hand of Jesus. He repented, right? Because he believed that he was the Lord, that he was suffering for these things that he didn't deserve, but they deserved him. And he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did he say? The Lord turns to him and said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. Why didn't he say the third heaven? Because even a last minute salvation and a true heartfelt cry to Christ, you're going to paradise. You see? The spirit filled in Christ are going to the third heaven. That's the pre. We're talking about the mid portion right here. And where are they going? Okay? Whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Listen to this. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord saith, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Again, Mount Zion. That's why that video, that teaching from 2018 was so powerful. Because it was the understanding of the Lord coming on Zion. When I get to these the, the videos of this other pastor, I don't know which parts that I share, but if you go and watch for yourselves, you must remember he only understands seven years. He doesn't understand the service of the, of the workers. He doesn't understand pre, mid, and post. He understands many things and has great understanding of many things, but not the revelation of the end of days. That wasn't for him. It's like many other things like I told you before. I, didn't dis I, I wasn't the one who discovered accession and non-accession. But the Spirit led us, led you guys to lead me in finding things to then discover and say, oh my goodness. Because without accession and non-accession understanding, this should have all happened last year. Or should have happened in the spring because we would have thought the house of Israel or just Israel as a whole. We needed to understand it. But was it discovered by, by me? No. It was discovered by two guys. One guy wrote about it in the 80s. Another guy, not knowing, wrote about it in the 90s. And now these are things that are taught to understand the proper counting of the kings in Scripture. But I didn't discover it. But the Spirit led us when we needed the understanding to prepare us and to help us out. Well, that's the same thing with this guy's teachings. You see, people... Like this guy here, when, when he talks about, see, and it's the Lord, he's coming with paradise. He's coming with Mount Zion, which is paradise. Well, then, what about the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives? Huh. There's an issue, isn't there? How could he be coming with heavenly Mount Zion and being on paradise, and yet, when he returns, he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives? You see, that's a contradiction in his teaching because of not understanding the revelation. And I'm not bashing him for it. I'm telling you guys so that you're cautious if you go and listen. Remember what you have understood and pull things out from, from in it to help you absorb everything that's being taught here so that you could see what's coming. Because Mount Zion is coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. Again, we just covered this one a little bit ago, right? Here he comes as a fiery flame, right? His judgment before him, a waste behind, all of that, right? Well, check this one out. What if we go into Ezekiel 
Let's go into here. Let's go into Esword. We'll go into Ezekiel chapter 40. If 39 is the end of the sixth year of seals, and the battle of Ezekiel 39 is that war with the Lord at the end of the sixth year of seals against the ten kings, then 40 would be what? 40 would be the beginning of that final, uh, of the seventh year of seals, right? He's destroyed them. Now we're coming into that final year, and listen to what it says. Let's start in verse 2. In the visions of God, brought he into, uh, um, brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain by which was the frame of the city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man who was appear whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood at the gate. What ends up happening here, guys? Now is going to come the instructions for what? The instructions for rebuilding the city, the streets, and the temple. Well, guess what? When you come into the chapters to years and you go to Ezekiel 40, where are you? You're in the seventh year of seals. The Lord is there on Mount Zion, on paradise. And what's going to come next? <coughs> Excuse me. The instruction to rebuild the city, the streets, and the temple that will take place during the next three and a half years, starting from the beginning of the eighth year of tribulation, which is the beginning of the trumpet judgments. So here we are seeing again the mountain of the Lord, right? Or a very high mountain. Well, get ready for what's coming next. Because it's going to start to get heavy now. It's going to start to get heavy. Let's go into Psalms 48. Starting in verse 1. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. You might not be able to read that because of the red highlight I used. it, But let me read verse 2 again. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. Remember, paradise. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king, uppercase. Well, remember I told you guys to remember that? When is the time of the king of, of Israel? The period of Israel's kings in the typology of the Old Testament, the Reformation time of the New Testament, and in the is to come is what? It's the Lord here on Mount Zion who is now the king of Israel. Who is now the king of Israel. And it's telling us here that this mountain of holiness, the mountain of God, which is Mount Zion, is in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. God is known in her places of refuge. This is the city. The her is the city. Verse 5. They saw it. Oh, let's start in verse 8. Continue from verse 8. For lo, the kings were assembled. They passed by together. They saw it, and so they marveled, they were troubled, and they hasted away. Okay? They marveled. They were astonished and amazed. They were troubled, right? They were agitated. They were vexed. They were, they were afraid, and they hasted away. They suddenly, in terrible fear, trembled and left. Fear took hold of them there. And pain as of a woman in travail. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with the east wind. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts 
in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. People have seen it. It, it, it's been seen. It freaked people out in seeing it. It's the mountain of the Lord, the city of the Lord of hosts. And where is Mount Zion? In the sides of the north. In the north. Let me show you something else. If you come to Luke 16... Let's read this little story of Luke 16 and see if we can start to comprehend this. And there was a, a starting in verse 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. So the rich guy is in hell. This is something that I wasn't, I, I couldn't fully comprehend before. If he's in hell, then how does what takes place next happen? He's in hell, lifting up his eyes in torment, he sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So this rich man is in hell. And when he looks, he sees off in the distance, he sees Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. How is that possible, possible if hell is below? He says, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in, in thy lifetime <coughs> receivest thy goods and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us, there is a great gulf fixed. So there's a big chasm, right? This big gulf in between them. So that they which would pass from thence to you cannot. Neither can they pass that would come from thence. Did you catch it? One is in hell. And the others are where? Where are they? They're in paradise. Hell is across the way from paradise, separated by a great gulf and protected in whatever sense in, in the size of that gulf that they cannot go one to the other. Where is paradise? Abraham is in paradise, brothers and sisters. Abraham's in paradise. The rich man was in hell. And they could see each other from across the way. Where is paradise, brothers and sisters? Do you remember this story in Hebrews? This great connection to all of this? In Hebrews chapter 11? Listen to what we, what we read about. We know Enoch is the pre-trib, right? Those rewarded diligently seeking, that's the pre-trib. They're literally going to vanish. Then we've got Noah. By faith, right? And became heir of the righteous, of the righteousness. Who are the heirs who are remaining to serve the Lord for 40 days and then remain to work during seals? Doesn't Romans chapter 8 call them co-heirs with Christ? Hello. And what about Abraham? What have we shown about this over the years that Abraham represents? Abraham represents the mid-trib great multitude rapture. Hebrews 11, verse 8, by faith, when, uh, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, <coughs> excuse me, obeyed, and he went not, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, 
dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Listen to this. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Who does Abraham represent? Abraham is the picture here of those going to great, uh, the, the great multitude rapture. They are like Abraham's children. Remember when we've taught on this? Only the foundation is laid during seals. During the first seven years of tribulation, a physical foundation is being laid in the midst of seals, while a spiritual foundation is being laid by the modern-day apostles during seals. At the end of seals, what's the only thing there in Jerusalem? The foundations. What else was Abraham told? Genesis 22. Abraham was told what? We covered this just recently, right? Verse uh, Genesis 22, verse 17. That in blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Abraham's descendants are the mid-trib great multitude rapture. The number which nobody can count. Precisely as Revelation chapter 7 said. Well, where's Abraham? Abraham's in paradise. Abraham's in paradise. Which means wherever paradise is, clearly below the earth... And according to Psalms 48 is in the north. Where is it? Is in the north. So it's in the north and it's clearly under the earth. I couldn't fully wrap my head around this before. It didn't make sense to me. But paradise is under the earth. I'm not saying it. I'm showing it to you right here. Scripture said it was up in the north and that it's under the earth. Which means it's here. But of course that makes sense that it's here. Right? Of course it makes sense that it was here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. What happened in the fall, right? After the fall, we saw that... Uh, where is it? Is it right here? Yes. In verse 24, Genesis 3, 24. And he drove out the man, which means, okay, fleshly man was dwelling in Eden, of course. And he was kicked out of it. And when he was kicked out of it, did it disappear? Did it leave the earth? No, it couldn't have. It says, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden a cherubim and a flaming, uh, sorry, he placed cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Why would you have to put cherubim to cover the entrance to the Garden of Eden if it was in heaven? Hello. Things that make you go, hmm. Things that you may have wondered over the years yourselves. Eden is still here in, uh, in or really under the earth. I hope that's, that's becoming clear for you. It's here. Under the earth in the north. I really had to share this piece here. Listen to what this says. Um, in verse in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, I had to share this with you. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvel marvelously. 
For I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it be told you. I just thought I'd throw that in because of what you're about to understand next. Let me go to a piece of, uh, of Apocrypha that you guys have heard me share on many, many times over the years. And the reason I'm going to it, you guys have all seen this, right? There's your pre-red horse, end of the sixth seal, mid-trib, great multitude rapture time. We've covered it many times. It's chapter 13, starting in verse 29, which is where we usually go. In reading it, I always read through or read over a specific piece. And I remembered it. I knew who was there, but I could never comprehend why it said what it said. Well, I'm going to help you out with that today, as it helped me. We're going to start in, this is in 2nd Ezra, chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 5. After this, I looked and behold, an innumerable multitude of men were gathered together from the four winds of heaven to make war against the man who came up out of the sea. You want to know why I never shared this with you guys before? Because I know that this is talking about the Lord. It makes it clear. But if you guys were to see potentially, I mean, I'm not saying you guys would have all thought this, but I didn't want you guys to get sidetracked in the thought of it. Because we know of another guy coming up out of the sea too, don't we? When the beast comes. He's coming up out of the sea. So I didn't want people to think, oh, this is the beast coming up out of the sea. You can't say it's the Lord. Yeah, it is the Lord. This one is the Lord, and it tells you itself. But what was difficult, even though I read it and I knew it was the Lord, the difficulty was comprehending why it said coming up out of the sea. So, okay, the man uh, who came up out of the sea. So they want to make war against the one who came up out of the sea. And I looked and behold, he carved out for himself a great mountain and flew upon it. And I tried to see the region or place from which the mountain was carved, but I could not. I remembered reading this a while back because I never spent much time in it outside after of being in those other parts that I share with you guys. The man coming up out of the sea with the great mountain, the, mount, the mountain carved without hand, just like Daniel, just like the end of the sixth year of seals, when he destroys the ten toes as the ten kings, right, as the ten horns, the same picture. He sees the mountain coming that the Lord flew on this is the picture we're building. What on earth is the Lord coming on that is a mountain that's flying through the sky? And I tried to see the region or place from which the mountain was carved, but I could not. It's coming from a region or place on the earth where the mountain was coming from. After this, I looked and behold, all who had gathered together against him to wage war with them were much afraid, yet dared fight. You see, that's the end of the sixth year of seals. That's the ten kings and the beast coming to fight. The end of the 42 months. Verse 12. After this, I saw the same man come down from the mountain and call to him another multitude that was peaceable. Okay, we cover this a lot, right? In the other portion. Then many people came to him, some of whom were joyful and some were sorrowful. Some of them were bound, and some of them were bringing offers, uh, sorry, were bringing others as tithings. Right? What is this? It's this right here. This is the pre-trib. Verse 29. Behold, the Most High will deliver those who are upon the earth, and bewilderment of mind shall take over those who remain on the earth. Right? The whole world will be caught off guard, like Luke 21. And then they shall plan, because there's, 50 days before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, people against people. And then it says what? Verse 32. And when these things come to pass and the signs occur, which I showed you before, 
Okay, so now all of this stuff of seals is going to pass and take place. And then shall my son be revealed whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. As a man coming up from the sea. He said what? This is the one that he had reserved. He had reserved them for the end. You see, look at verse, go back a little bit. We go back to 18. It says, but alas, for those also who are left. Uh, oh, sorry. Verse 18, because they understand what is reserved in the last day. No, what did I just see? Sorry, I lost my, my place. Well, what ends up happening is you find out that the Lord, the Father, says that he was reserved for this last time. Let me see. Oh, here it is right here. Oh, yeah, I did have it highlighted just at the top. So verse 25, this is the interpretation of the vision. As for you seeing a man come up from the heart of the sea, from the heart of the sea, this is he whom the Most High had been keeping many years, who will himself deliver his creation and he will direct those who are left who did he call him his son his son who is who is revealed coming up from the sea and he's coming with what verse 35 but he shall stand on top of mount zion he's coming on paradise with heavenly mount zion and zion will come to be what It'll come to be made manifest to all people. That's why they're all freaking out at the end of the sixth year of seals. And look at what it says. Prepared and built. Hello. As you saw the mountain carved without hands. And then they all come to try to fight against him. He destroys them with the, the sword of his mouth, right? With the word of, of, his, of his mouth, the sword of the word. And then he's going to gather to himself what? A multitude that was peaceable, and they're related to the ten tribes, the world. Coming up from the sea. Meaning a place where there's water, where there's a mountain. It's in the north. It's the mountain of the Lord. It's paradise. It's under the earth, just like where Abraham was with the rich man with a gulf in between hell and paradise. And at the end of the sixth year of seals, it's coming up out of the earth from the north, and the whole world will see it and be in utter panic. Let's now have a listen to a fair bit of this teaching. This starts, and we're going to be listening to a little bit of this. This starts with something many of you guys will have heard of with Admiral Byrd. Now, I have heard of Admiral Byrd before. And just so you guys know, I'm going to keep this at 1.5 speed. So if you're listening to me faster, go ahead and slow it down because I want to make sure this is a little bit speedier because we're watching quite a bit. Many of you will have heard of Admiral Byrd before. I did. Many people have. Uh, he was very well reputed. He's going to talk about him here briefly. But I had never, I had heard about the diary. I had never really gone into it or read it. I just thought this stuff of the North and all of that, I, you know, whatever, I'll just let it be. But remember the timing of all of this for us. In a people being prepared, brothers and sisters, I want you to remember the reason for this preparation. So our hearts will be ready to bear witness to what is coming. That we will not be deceived by what we've been deceived by in the world. By what the world has told us about all these things. Which I myself believed was only on the bad side of things. Remember, there is a spiritual, but there is also a physical, as above so below we are all spirit beings 
and we are currently covered in these flesh suits. We know that they can come into our fleshly line as well and go back into the spirit. The Lord can be everything. Spirit, light, and flesh and be in all three simultaneously. Okay? So this Admiral Byrd story, this first one we're going to go through, I had never read the diary or, or seen these parts. And this diary part is just one portion, but it's the storyline within it. And then when we get to the second portion, the other video, then we're going to see some, some, some crazier details in there as well based on what they called the place, um, uh, uh, what they called their leader. It's incredible. So let's have a listen to this for a little bit. I'll jump in on occasion here and there as well. So this is like a college class. It's more, more like a college course than it is church service, all right, because we're going to learn some things. Richard E. Byrd. October 25th, 1888, March 11th, 1957, was an American naval officer and explorer. He was a recipient of the Medal of Honor, the highest honor for valor given by the United States. He was a hero, folks. He, he would risk his life to save other men during the war. Uh, he's a, he was an amazing man. Um, it says that he was a pioneering American aviator, polar explorer, organizer of a polar logistics aircraft flights in which he served as navigator and expedition leader across the Atlantic Ocean, a segment of the Arctic Ocean, a segment of the Antarctic Plateau. Bird said that his ex expeditions had been the first to reach both the North Pole and the South Pole by air. His belief to have reached the North Pole is disputed. No, it's not disputed. It's disputed by people who don't want you to know the truth. But they found his diary. I'll explain that in a second. He here's, here's an interesting side note. You see, the North Pole is rarely talked about protecting nobody can go. We're all told it's a frozen cap up there and everything else, right? And nobody really, there's no real talk about expeditions or governments up there and everything else. But what about the South Pole? Everybody is traveling to the South Pole. All the leaders, the bishops, the church, they're setting up and visiting and all these people are going down there to the South Pole. But to the North, you hear next to nothing. Isn't that interesting? He's also known for discovering Mount uh, Sidley, the largest dormant volcano in Antarctica. Um, this man is probably one of the only men that actually saw where the firmament came down and reached the earth apart from Enoch himself. He's seen everything at the North Pole he didn't tell us about, but he told us a lot. But this is, this is Admiral Byrd. Of course, this is his diary. I have it right here. Y'all need to get this for yourself. But uh, let's read some of this. This I found last night to confirm the legitimacy of this, that this is legitimate, his diary. Byrd's, uh, much of his stuff was donated to the Ohio State University when he died. He hid this diary within his stuff that was donated to Ohio State, and it wasn't discovered until about, I think it was about 1996. But here's the confirmation. Bird diary found May 8, 1996. This is Ohio State News. Uh, as you can see up there, news.osu.edu. Bird diary of the North Pole flight found in University Archives, Columbus, Ohio. Exactly 70 years after famed explorer Admiral Richard E. Bird claimed to have been the first to fly over the North Pole, Ohio State University archivist uh, announced that they had found Bird's diary, which gives the clearest picture of yet what happened during that famous flight. While Bird has been long credited as being the first to reach the pole, some scholars dispute that claim. Some suggest that he never reached the pole during his flight. Some have argued that Bird simply took off and flew around long enough to have made the trip to the pole and then returned. The newly found diary shows conclusively that Bird believed he actually reached the pole at the time of the flight, but a review of the material by one outside expert also suggests Bird never reached the goal. No, he reached it, all right. The diary, a weathered 8 by 9 inch brown notebook, was hidden among Bird's materials maintained by Ohio State. Chief archivist Raymond Go, Go -Erler, or Go -Erler, I guess, found the diary while searching through a box of artifacts in the collection. So this was just hidden until I believe God wanted it to come out. Um, it offers proof that Bird thought he reached the North Pole. Uh, of course, he had someone with him. Um, I'm gonna, you guys can all read this later. I was gonna get down here, what he said. Uh, where is it? Come on now. Let's see, where is it here? Um, yeah, he talks about his oil leak. Yeah, Rollins called the finding of the diary one of the most remarkable discoveries in the history of polar archival research. So this is Ohio State University, not Pastor Dean, not speculation, right? So they vouch for the legitimacy of this diary being Admiral Byrd's, written when he wrote it, before he died, and they have it in their archives. Now, it was released to the world. Now, here's what Byrd, we're going to go through this, and I'm doing this, not because you can't read it yourself, but I need to cover some things and pause throughout. But notice that when he starts his diary, he says, I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It, con it concerns my Arctic flight of the 19th day of February in the year of 1947. He says, there comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance, and the one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Why? Because the United States government would have put him in prison or killed him for treason. 
Uh, perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record it here for all to read one day. He said, in a world of greed and exploitation of certain of mankind can no longer suppress that which is the truth. Now, this is interesting because the Bible clearly tells us that men would suppress the truth, particularly about creation, and that God would have shown it to them. Now, I shared this last week, but I want you to see it again. Romans 1, 18 says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness of unrighteousness of men who hold or withhold or suppress. When you look that up in the Greek, the original Greek, it means to withhold or suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them. Now, all of us can't go to the Antarctic and look and do an expedition all the way in to find the firmament. But Berg did. We can't finance an expedition to the North Pole. And if we could, we probably wouldn't get permission by governments of the world to go there. Not now, anyway. And now notice I'll he says... in here, too. You guys have heard me often say this: that whether the Earth is flat or round, it, it's never been my area that I look into. The Spirit has never led me into it. I believe it's highly probable possible that it's flat, but if it's round, then it's round. I'm okay with it as well. I'm, this has nothing to do with flat or round. This is about the revelation of paradise, where it is, and when it's coming, and what all of this stuff will look like. And when you grasp what's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, you will then have a greater picture of what's coming in trumpet's time when I've explained in the past that the Lord is going to make a covenant with all people, it will suddenly make crystal clear sense <laughs> when they will have seen what came and what happened. As for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being stood by the things that are made even his eternal power in God, so, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now think about this. He's saying these men, especially these men who have seen these things, are without excuse. Now this is important because it gets fascinating as we go on in his diary here. And of course, here's the, the Greek word for hold, to hold down, um, to withhold. So see, they withhold things from us. That's why you always believe God. So here it is, flight log, base camp, Arctic, February 19, 1947. Let's go through some of this. Both magnetic and gyro. So he left at 0600 hours, 6 o'clock in the morning. By 3 hours and 10 minutes, he said, both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with the sun, compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there's no indication of icing. So three hours into it, now he's already in the Arctic. He's already inside the Arctic Circle. He's now flown three hours north toward the North Pole, and he says now the, the compass is starting to, and the gyroscope starting to wobble, and everything's starting, he can't use it. Every Arctic explorer, when they got close to the North Pole, it's called the dipping of the needle. The compass stopped working. This is the testimony of every Arctic explorer. Okay? So this is not just Admiral Byrd. Olaf Jensen and his father in 1838, when they went there, same thing. The compass we'll needle started dipping, and when it dips, if the compass needle touches the bottom of the compass or the top, it can't move. You can't get a correct reading, and that's because they're, they're getting right over, right near, too close to that magnetic mountain, starting to screw everything up. All right, so, oh, 09, 15 hours. He says, now get this. Remember, there's no land there. Isn't that what the government of the United States has told us? There's no land there. So just five minutes later into his flight, three hours and 15 minutes, he says, in the distance, he sees what appears to be mountains. See, what you have to determine all this is Admiral Byrd liar is he telling the truth. God doesn't care if you're mad and angry. He wants you to talk to him either way. Oh, did I forget something? Ah, yeah. He says, at 0, 0949 hours, 29 minutes elapsed, flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. They are mountains and consisting of a small range that I have never seen before. Sounds like Ezekiel. I saw mountains. Oh. 10 o'clock, four hours into his flight. We are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. Now, at this point, I believe he's already entered into Eden. All right? He's beginning to see the stream, and he says, look what he says here. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. No, it's the way God said it was. You just believe the government up until your eyes are seeing something different. All right? He keeps going. We should be over ice and snow to the port side. There are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is still oscillating back and forth. But yet, what do we find? Forest. Wait a minute. Last time I checked, trees needed land <laughs> to grow in. 10.05 hours. I altered altitude to 1,400 feet and executed a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light here seems different. It's because God is the light there. All right, I'll get into that later. I cannot see the sun anymore because it's lit by a different type. 
We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be large, a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible, yet there it is. Decrease altitude to 1,000 feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 10.30 hours, encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature, now remember, they're at the North Pole. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Wait a minute, I thought it was, everything was frozen up there. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. They are now under the earth. 1130 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. I got off our port and starboard... The city of our God, the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, paradise on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. <coughs> now, let me, <laughs> let me, let me rewind, rewind that just a little bit. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. Okay. And normal, if I may use that word. Ahead, we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. I got off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. <laughs> strange type of aircraft. Hmm. Now, let me say this. We're going to get into this because I believe people are, people, some people are trying to take this and spin it about UFOs. You have to remember that the Bible talks about angels having chariots, some kind of vehicles and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. Now, let me say this. We're going to get into this because I believe people, are, people, some people are trying to take this and spin it about UFOs. You have to remember that the Bible talks about angels having chariots, some kind of vehicles that they actually would fly in. Why they need them, I don't know, but they have them. You see, this is where you got to, this is where it's going to start to get tough because for decades we have all grown up with this alien idea of all the aliens and it's bad and it's just they're otherworldly and they're out in space and but we've always understood most of us have understood that they're they're the fallen angels right that they're all the bad ones so i don't really deny that there's quote unquote aliens but they're not really aliens as the world's trying to tell us well if we're all spirit which is what i said that the reason i said that before if we're all spirit then obviously they can come and go when when our flesh time is done we'll be able to come and go you see we're all spirit so if there's one type that can do it and the lord created them doesn't the good side have them too am i saying the lord is an alien no am i saying the angels are aliens no but they are physically coming and going with something in the physical i'm not talking about when our flesh is done or the enochs that are literally going to vanish as enoch and go into the third heaven i'm talking about the elijahs the elijahs who were seen who the elijah who was seen going up in a chariot in a whirlwind that's what we're talking about and the scripture tells us what it looked like so just be patient, listen, absorb this, because it's really about us understanding and comprehending ahead of time what it is this remnant group will see at the end of seals, that we can prepare the people to understand when it comes, not to be freaked out by it, but to be ready in the Lord. We don't know from Scripture what they look like. Though we are told in the book of Zechariah that we will have in the last days flying scrolls that will deceive mankind. But just remember this. The fallen angels, the bad angels, probably took some or kept some of their vehicles. And the good angels have them as well. And again, I believe it's angels at the North Pole. I explained explain that, but they're a different kind of angel. But we'll get into that. But he just says, he talks about their disc shape. They have a radiant quality to them. They're close enough now that the markings on them, he said, he said it's a type of swastika. Now, if we go back, we got to remember that the so-called swastika, he's not saying it's a real swastika, but the swastika was stolen, symbol that, that Hitler stole. It now remember, this is at first, this is jarring, right? You hear, oh, and it's a type of swastika-looking symbol. 
Well, you're also going to hear about another word, uh, Aryan. So do you think maybe Hitler, who traveled, who had people going all over the globe to find all these relics and all these ancient things, do you think there's a reason why he took the quote-unquote swastika? The reason it was called swastika is because it was after World War II. Everybody understood this word for swastika. Well, he also called them, you know, the Aryan race, right? Where did he get, why did he use that name? Why did he use swastika? Where, where did he get these things? Well, we're finding out because he had sent people all over the world and he was trying to create his own, his own people, his, his own world of things. That's why he was a type of, of antichrist, like in the second half of trumpets. He was, he was another, he was a type of, of uh, um, uh, the one coming out of the pit in our is, not in the is to come, okay? Actually represented um, much different. I mean, it was used in Hinduism and other places that had it. It, it was not, how do I put it? And he said it's a type of swastika, so it's probably some ki type of cross type symbol or whatever. Um, but we don't. He said, this is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again, they will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 hours, our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with perhaps a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax. Admiral, you are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control. It's now turning itself. The controls are useless. Um, the Prophet wasallam said he is not a believer who goes to sleep full while his neighbor is... 11.40 hours, another radio message received. We will begin the landing process now, and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent. As though caught in some great unseen elevator, the downward motion is negligible, and we touch down within only a slight jolt. 11.45 hours, I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. Again, this is Medal of Honor, United States Navy hero, Highly decorated, the most experienced Arctic explorer of our time. Is he a crazy man? Just found a little picture, something like that. He said, I do not know what's going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. From this point, I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination and would seem all but madness if it had not happened. The radio and I, the radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We were then boarded on small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us toward the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of crystal material, kind of like the firmament. Hmm. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design, a design board of a Frank Lloyd Wright or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are giving some type of warm beverage which tastes like nothing I have ever savored before. It is delicious. <laughs> He says, after about 10 minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters and announce that I am to accompany them. I have no choice <laughs> but to comply. I leave my radio man behind, and we walk a short distance and enter into what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments. The machine stops, and the door lifts silently upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by a rose-colored light that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. The great door slides noises noiselessly open, and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks, have no fear, Admiral, you have an audience with the master. I step inside and my eyes adjust to the beautiful coloration that seems to be filling the room completely. 1838, Smoky God, Olaf and his father are taken from the city of Jehu under the earth to Eden to meet what he called the high priest of the, the beings there that worship the Smoky God Jehovah. So we get more information actually from Olaf than we do from the Admiral, but the Admiral is being very careful, right? He says, uh, I step inside my eyes adjust to the beautiful coloration that seems to be filling the room completely. You heard that there briefly, right? So when we get to this other video and we go into some clips of it, this is the longest single clip, but when we go into some of these other clips, when we get to the second video, and he talks about that Olaf one with his son and so forth, you just heard him say that the one that's there, who they call, what was it? Uh, uh, was it Jehovah? And he was what? The high priest. When the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, and he is here, what? Have we described them in the scriptures to be? It's when he's coming as high priest and king. The Messiah ben Joseph. The Melchizedek. When he's here on paradise, Mount Zion, this thing that's going to come from the north that will freak the world out. That's being described here in part. 
wild. Wild when you understand what we understand about Mount Zion coming. It's craziness. Then I began to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the, the most beautiful sight of my entire existence. It is, in fact, too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think there exists a human term that I can describe it in any detail with justice. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I'm seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles and speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here. Wait a minute. Angels guard the place to keep people out. Remember? That's what the Bible says. We have let you enter in here because you are of noble character and well-known on the surface world. Admiral. He was let in to be a witness. And there was the Bible saying, the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Right? We have let you enter here because you are of noble character, well-known on the surface world. Admiral. Surface world, I half gasp under my breath. He, he didn't realize he was underneath the earth. But that's why his radio didn't work. We can't get signals now from cell towers that are above. <laughs> yes, the master replies with a smile. You are in the domain of the Ariana. I'm going to explain to you. I looked up what that means. It'll be blown away. In the inner world of the earth, we shall not long delay your mission, and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Now, here's the Ariana. Here's the meaning. It's both Italian and Greek in its origin. It means most holy. Holy ones. Sanctified ones. Not wicked ones, not evil ones. See, again, that, that was, that was uh, uh, Hitler corrupting it all, right? Corrupting the image, that, that, that swastika-type look, and using the Aryans from Ariana in that same wording. Notice it says it's an angelic name. So we'll get into what kind of angels we're talking about. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at the alarming time we sent our flying machines, they called flugel or flugel rads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must, for you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world. Now remember, the governments of the world lie to you and say that these are aliens. No, angels are messengers from God. Gabriel was sent to Daniel. Gabriel was sent to Mary. Angels are sent to be messengers. He say, angels have visited your leaders. He said, our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Think about that. Now you have been chosen to be a witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted, but what does this have to do with me, sir? This is the moment. This is what you've come for. This is why we've worked around the clock. The master's eyes seemed to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. Biden, Obama, the Bush family, Justin Trudeau, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates. Destroy this world. Destroy you. Destroy everything in it. Monsanto. I mean, we could go down the list. This is in 1947. Think about where we are now. I nodded, and the mask continued. In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flu jewel rads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world, a black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your science. No safety. Vaccines, maybe? It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war, talking about World War II, who kill, which killed 60 million people. He said, your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? No, I answer. It happened once before. The Dark Ages came and they lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the man. Did you hear that? <clears throat> there's, a, there's a greater war coming than your World War II. Be trampled on and so forth, right? Worse than ever. And what did he say? His answer. His answer was prophetic. He knows that it will happen again, right? It happened before the Dark Ages and they lasted for more than 500 years. Let me show you something. Do you want to see how crazy all of this is? How, how, just, it's, it's over the top wild. 
What happens from mid seals to the end of seals? It's the Dark Ages. From the time that the beast gets his power and they flee into the wilderness to the end of the sixth year of seals when the Lord comes, it's the same reference to the time of the Dark Ages. Wild. I'm telling you, the whole thing, the whole revelation, the leading of the Spirit in all of this, for us to receive this at this time, is prophetically connected and to prepare our minds, our hearts, our spirits. 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the master, the dark ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall. This is Isaiah 60, verse 2. Darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness the people. He said, but I believe that some of your race will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. Oh, boy, we got some places to go with this. We see at a great distance the new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures. And they will be, now remember this, as we get into this in the days ahead, he says that they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again to help revive your culture and your race. So he's saying, when the time comes, we come out of here to help you restore. Exactly. We come out of here to help you restore after the devastation, which is him coming with heavenly Mount Zion. Come on now. Perhaps by then you will have learned the futility of war and its strife, and after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. With these closing words, our meeting seemed at an end. I stood for a moment as in a dream, but yet I knew this was reality. And for some strange reason, I bowed slightly, <laughs> either out of respect or humility. I do not know which. 300 hours, we land smoothly at base camp. We have a mission. Now, I, I sped this up. They, of course, helped them take off. They escorted them back out to the surface, and then they were 24, something 27 miles away. But March 11, 1947, so about a month later, or just a few weeks later, he says, I have attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon, and I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for several hours, six hours, 39 minutes to be exact. I am interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal, he said. He said, I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of the United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man. I must obey orders. So now years pass. Final entry, December 30th, 1956. This can be the only hope for mankind. I have seen the truth, and it has quickened my spirit and set me free. I have done my duty toward the monstrous military industrial complex. Now the long night begins to approach, but there shall be no end. Just as the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of truth shall come again, and those who are of darkness shall fall in its light. For I have seen that land beyond the pole, that center of the great unknown. That was his final entry. I bet you didn't know this. In North Gaza, after the conflict, some families are so hungry. Admiral Richard E. Byrd, United States Navy, December 24th. Pretty wild, right? That's just one. Another story gets even more wild. But let me, let me go into one more section of this one. This one is just... Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Was it to continue or just to that piece? Oh, yeah. Uh, 1032, I think it was. So let's have a listen to this. <clears throat> this is um, about an, uh, uh, an ancient prophecy. Here we go. There is a legend said to take back thousands of years and reference a mythical land that can be found in various ancient texts. This legend comes with a prophecy. When the gradual deterioration of mankind as the ideology of materialism spreads over the earth and barbarian forces who follow this ideology are united under an evil leader and think there is nothing left to conquer, the myths will lift to reveal the snowy mountains of an ancient city. This evil force reveal the snowy mountains of an ancient city who will come and conquer the darkness of and the evil forces. This is the end of the sixth year of seals, guys. Will attack with a huge army, equipped with terrible weapons. Then the king of the city will emerge from this ancient place with a huge army to vanquish those dark forces and usher in a worldwide golden age. Some believe that we are about to leave these times. All of that's biblical. When you see the... It's all biblical. It is, guys. It is biblical. <laughs> you know, this was interesting right here, too. So those who talk about flat earth and so forth, you know, these were all of the ancient 
uh, pictures of, you know, maps of the Earth. And this was the North Pole. There's your four rivers going out, right? And so where is it? Where is the North Pole? Where is Mount Zion? It's right here. It's right here and going below. So when you see the Son of Man on a mountain carved without hand from where I don't know, I could not see it. I could not see it. I don't know where he came from. I don't know where the, the mountain carved without hand came from. But I saw the man coming up out of the sea with a mountain carved without hand. That's not just the Apocrypha. We have it, as we saw, in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 is just as clear for us. It's back there somewhere, right? We covered it. We know what's coming, guys. And I'm hoping that this will help us wrap our minds around understanding this piece. This incredible, incredible piece. It is not that the Lord is an alien as the world has told us and that he's sending out aliens as the world has told us. They are all angels. There are good ones and there are bad ones. A third of them fall, two-thirds of them remain. They're coming with something, guys. This is the revelation of grasping what the Lord is coming on and with at the end of the sixth year of seals. Let's go to the next part. All right, now, here's what it says. It says the smoky God revelation. <laughs> Excuse me. I need to slow that down a bit for you guys. So this is the other one. This is the smoky God, uh, uh, the smoky God voyage. And this one is by two Norwegians. Yeah, two Norwegians. It's not a, a, a fairy tale. It's passed off as a fairy tale, but we know uh, the guy talks about it that it, it wasn't. It was truth. And th the story is fascinating. So we're going to cover a few clips in it, and then I'm going to bring in and tie into the rest of Revelation. I told you this one was going to be a while. Voyage uh, Journey to the Inner Earth is a book presented as a true account. Now, this is important. This book is presented as a true account. Anybody says is it, it's fairy tale or fiction, that's your opinion. But it's presented by the author and and the circumstances around which he presented this truth make me believe that it is a true account now not only that is that there are things you're going to see in this that olaf jensen and his father they were, they were fishermen from norway and you're going to find out that they were not christians at all they were not even like lukewarm christians they worshiped odin and thor they did not have bible they didn't read their bible this is what makes this account so amazing because you would think that they would twist the story to fit the the uh the norse mythology but they did not. It fits Christian theology. Yet throughout the whole thing, they continue their, their dedication to Odin and Thor, all right? Which to me is just mind-blowing. Which to me tells me that these men had integrity to just tell you, well, here's what they said. Now, I think Admiral Byrd kept back some things that they said for his own reasons. But notice it says this is presented as a true account written by Willis George Emerson in 1908, which describes the adventures of Olaf Jensen, a Norwegian sailor who sailed with his father through an entrance to the Earth's interior at the North Pole for two years. Jensen lived with the inhabitants of the underground network of colonies who Emerson writes were 12 feet tall, whose world was lit by a smoky central sun. Their capital city was said to be the original Garden of Eden. All right? Uh, now, a, a Norseman and a, and a worshiper of Odin and Thor would call it Asgard. They did never called it Asgard. They called it Eden. That's right. All right? Why? Because the people there told them it was Eden. Um, this is in the author's forward. It says, according to Olaf Jensen, in the beginning of this world of ours was created solely for the within world, where are located four great rivers, the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gihon, and the Hittikel. The same uh, names of rivers when applied to streams on the outside surface of the earth are purely traditional from the uh, antiquity beyond the memory of man. On the top, now remember this, on the top of a high mountain near the fountainhead of these four rivers, Olaf Jensen, the Norseman, claims to have discovered the long-lost Garden of Eden, the veritable navel of the earth, and to have spent over two years studying and reconnecting with this marvelous within land, exuberant and stupendous plant life and abounding with giant animals, a land where the people live to be centuries old after the order of Methuselah and other Bible characters, a region where one quarter of the inner surface is water and three quarters land, where there are large oceans, many rivers and lakes, where the cities are uh, superlative in construction and magnificence, and uh, where modes of transportation are far in advance of ours, as with our boasted achievements in advance of the inhabitants of the darkest, of darkest Africa. Um, now, some of this may be hard, but I, I did it as quickly as I could. He said, my father was a man fully six feet three and weighed over 15 stone, a typical Norseman of the most rugged sort. 
capable of more endurance than any other man I have ever known. He possessed the gentleness of a woman in tender little ways, yet his determination and willpower were beyond description. His will admitted no defeat. I just had to read. I love that. This is a man's man there, but he wasn't a cruel man. He says, I was in my 19th year when we started on what proved to be our last trip as fishermen, and which resulted in a strange story which shall be given to the world, but not until I have fin finished my earthly pilgrimage. He says, I dare not allow the facts as I know them to be published while I am living, for fear of further humiliation, confinement, and suffering. First of all, I was put in irons by the captain of the whaling vessel that rescued me for no other reason than I told of the truth about the marvelous discoveries my father, by my father and myself. But this was far from being the end of my tortures. Um, after four years and eight months absence, I reached Stockholm only to find my mother had died the previous year and the property left by my parents in the possession of my mother's people, but it was once made over to me. All might have been well had I erased from my memory the story of our adventure and my father's terrible death. Finally, on the day, on one day, I told the story to my uncle, Gustav Osterlin, a man of considerable property, and urged him to fit out an expedition for me to make another voyage to the strange land. At first, I thought he favored my project. He seemed interested in inviting me to go before certain officials and, and explain to them, as I had to him, the story of our travels and discoveries. Imagine my disappointment and horror when, upon the conclusion of my narrative, certain papers were signed by my uncle, and without warning, I found myself arrested and hurried away to dismissal and fearful confinement in a madhouse where I remained for 28 years long. Tedious, he said, frightful years of suffering. 28 years for telling this story. So he determined that he would not tell this story until he was on his deathbed. Now think about this. This man just tells a story and he gets put in an insane asylum for 28 years. But he is determined that the world will have this. He's just not going to do it in his lifetime. Now what does that tell you? Does he think it's true? Does it sound like just he's trying to make up a fairy tale? I don't think so. Um, Wild stuff, right? Let's, uh, let's go on a little bit further. <laughs> the descriptions, man. It it gets wild. It gets wild. All right. He says, my, my father, just like I told you a minute ago, he said, my father was an ardent believer in Odin and Thor and had frequently told me they were gods who came from far beyond the north wind. Again, so his religion, Odin and Thor, as God, the north, it wouldn't have been about Eden and the god Jehovah of the Bible from this man. He says, there was a tradition, my father explained, that still farther northward was a land more beautiful than any mortal man had ever known, and that it was inhabited by the chosen. Now, here's what's interesting. In every culture, whether it be Norse culture, Indian culture, you could go down Chinese, Japanese, in every culture, they have a story about a land in the north, paradise. Some of them are Shambhala, Shangri-La, y'all heard these terms. Maru, right? Well, think about it. All of these stories, like the flood, right? They all have these stories. Let's go on a little bit further. <clears throat> if I can get my clicker, there we go. Thor. Well, so they go through this storm, right? And he says, I tried to forget my thirst by busying myself with bringing up some food in an empty vessel from the hold. Reaching over the side rail, I filled the vessel with water for the purpose of laving my hands and face. To my astonishment, the water came in contact with my lips. I could taste no salt. I was startled by the discovery. Father, I, I fairly gasped, the water, the water, it is fresh. What, Olaf? Exclaimed my father, glancing hastily around. Surely you are mistaken. There is no land. See, for fresh water in the middle of the ocean, there must be land somewhere. And his father, who is a very experienced Norse fisherman, goes, wait a minute, fresh water? There can't be fresh water because there's no land around here. Guess what that meant? They were near land. And he says, there's no land. You are going mad. But taste it, I cried. And thus he made the discovery that the water was indeed fresh, absolutely so, without the at least briny taste or even the suspicion of a salty flavor. So it wasn't even river and ocean water mix. I mean, it was fresh water. So guess what they've just entered into, and they don't realize it. They've made it into one of those rivers in the north. They don't know it yet, but they've made their way into it. Um, and thus we made the discovery that the water was indeed fresh, absolutely so, without the least brine taste. He said, my father declared it was a heavenly dispensation of mercy from the gods Odin and Thor. Um, he's pretty well devoted, right? He says, we were almost beside ourselves with joy, but hunger bade us in and enforce, our, enforce fast. Now that we had found fresh water in the open sea, what might not be expected this strange latitude where the ship had never sailed and the splash of an oar had never been heard, we had scarcely appeased our hunger when a breeze began filling the idle sails. Glancing at the compass, we found the northern point pressing hard against the glass. In, my, to, in response to my surprise, my father said, I've heard of this before. It's what they call the dipping of the needle. Now, they are now so close to the North Pole that the compass is starting to go crazy. It's starting to dip and not, they, it can't control itself, right? This has happened to every Arctic explorer that got close. All right? And I'm talking about all kinds. We'll talk about this more in a minute. But notice he said that as they got into this open water, I thought this was interesting because he was, he said, I frequently lay down on the bunker of our little sloop and looked far up into the blue dome of the sky. And notwithstanding, the sun was shining far away in the east. And I always saw a single star overhead. For several days when I looked for this star, it was always there directly above. 
see what might not be expect this strange latitude where the ship had never sailed and the spot further point pressing hard against the glass. In my to, in response to my single star overhead, for several days when I looked for this star, it was always there directly above us. So they were directly underneath the North Star, Polaris. So every time he's looking at the stars, right there. So we know where they were. He's, he's just by saying that, we know where he is. Um, he says, one day soon after this, so that again, they sailed for another day, um, or several days. He said, I felt exceedingly drowsy and fell into a sound sleep, but it seemed that I almost immediately was aroused by my father's vigorous shaking of me by the shoulder, saying, Olaf, awaken, there is land in sight. I sprang to my feet, oh, joy unspeakable. They are far in the distance, yet directly in our path were lands jutting boldly out into the sea. The shoreline stretched far away to the right of us. As far as the eye could see, all along the sandy beach were waves breaking into choppy foam, receding, then going forward again. Uh, the banks were, listen to this, the banks were covered with trees and vegetation. I cannot express my feelings of exultation at this discovery. My, my father stood motionless with his hand on the tiller, looking straight ahead, pouring out his heart in thankful prayer and thanksgiving to the god Odin and Thor. Uh, in the meantime, a net which we found in stowage had been cast, and we caught f a few fish to add it to our dwindling stock of provisions. Now notice he says, they see this place of vegetation, trees. They're extreme. They're as far north just about as you can be. Then he says, we sailed for three more days. So they're, they're getting there. We sailed for three days along the shoreline, then came to the mouth of a fort or river of immense size. It seemed more like a great bay. Into this we turned our fishing craft. Now, what? this is just amazing here. He says, by the assistance, uh, uh, it says, the direction being slightly northeast of south, by the assistance of a fretful wind that came to our aid about 12 hours out of every 24, we continued to make our way inland into what afterward proved to be a mighty river, which we learned was called by the inhabitants the Hittikel. We continued our journey for 10 more days. So they got into that river. So where are they headed for 10 more days? To the middle. Mm -hmm. um, they talked about the water that had become fresh. And then he says this. He says that we lost no time replenishing our cast. We continued to sail farther up the river when the wind was favorable. Along the banks, great forest, miles in extent, could be seen stretching away from the shoreline. The trees were of enormous size. We landed after anchoring near a sandy beach. We waded ashore and were rewarded by finding a quantity of nuts that were very palatable and satisfying to hunger. And a welcome change from our monotony mot of, of uh, stock provisions. Here we go. Monotony, I should say. Here we go. Now, here, here he says it was the 1st of September. So over five months they had been at sea leaving from Stockholm. Suddenly we were frightened out of our wits by hearing in the far distance the singing of people. Very soon thereafter, we discovered a huge ship gliding down the river directly toward us. Those aboard were singing in one mighty chorus that was echoing from bank to bank, sounded like a thousand voices, filling the whole universe with quivering melody. The accompaniment was played with stringed instruments, not like un unlike our harps. They spoke to us in a very strange language. It was a larger ship than we had ever seen and was differently constructed. So at this particular time, our sloop was becalmed and not far from the shore. The bank of the river covered with mammoth trees, rose up several hundred feet in beautiful ashen. Uh, we seemed to be on the edge of some primeval forest that doubtless stretched far inland. The immense craft paused, and almost immediately a uh, boat was lowered. Six men of gigantic stature rode to our little fishing sloop. They spoke to us in a strange language. We knew uh, from their manner, however, they were not unfriendly. Uh, they talked a great deal among themselves, and one of them laughed immoderately as though in finding us a queer discovery had been made. One of them spied our compass, and it seemed to interest them more than any other part of our sloop. Finally, the leader motioned and asked if we were willing to leave our craft and go aboard their ship. And the father, his father said, what say you, my son? Asked my father. They cannot do any more than kill us. They seem to be kindly disposed, I replied, although what terrible giants. They must be the select six of the kingdom's crack regiment. They, they uh, just look at their great size. So, <laughs> isn't it crazy, right? Just a wild, wild story. Let's keep going. Even the height, like the dad, 6'3", and he ends up coming to his, uh, he comes to the, the height of the waist of one of them. Let's go a little bit more. The charge of one of the men, Jules Gaudia and his wife, for the purpose of being educated in their language. And we, on, on our part, we were just as eager to learn. So anyway, they start spending powerful time. They go, they go back up the river. Um, and then he talks about, in the meantime, we had lost sight of the sun's rays, but we found a radiance within emanating from a dull red sun which had already attracted our attention, now giving out white light, seemingly uh, from a cloud bank far away from us. It dispensed greater light than two full moons and so on. He just goes on to talk about this. And <laughs> a greater light inside, but it wasn't the sun, right? Again, all of these little pieces, but these guys were, were Norsemen, right? Let's see, where are we going here? 4750. Let's go a little bit further up. There's just so much here. I, I could spend a, a morning doing this, but I don't. He talks about they were at the city of Jehu. Um, they had electricity. This is before there was electricity. And they had electricity there. And um, he said the domes of the public buildings were of gold. He said they had great vineyards, agriculture. They appeared to be uh, the principal occupation of the people appeared to be agriculture. The hillsides were covered in vineyards. The valleys were devoted to growing grain. I never saw such a display of gold. Yeah, Trump would like would like this place. Um, I mean, you could go on, on down the line. They talked about the city they were in, the city of Jehu. Um, 
and talked about the vegetation that grows there. He said the great redwood trees of California would be considered underbrush to the trees there. Now, what's interesting about that <clears throat> is that the book of Ezekiel talks about the trees. Yeah, the great trees. Let's keep going. Let's go to 5825. So they're curious. They're very curious about us and about our relationship with God and how all that works. Now, I, I pulled this out. Just wanted you to see it. I'm, gonna, I'm really going to start. I got to get through this quicker. Well, notice he said the smoky God is the throne of their who? Jehovah. This is related in this book several times that they worship Jehovah. Now, what puzzled me and what bothered me about this, I thought, well, why wouldn't, if these are angelic beings, the sons of God, why wouldn't there be more talk of Jesus and salvation? And I thought to myself, well, they don't, angelic beings don't get saved like, like us. They're not, it's not that their loyalty is not to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they're not going to be as Jesus-focused, say, as we are, though they worship Jesus and all this stuff. I just think it was to show us that they were not us. Okay, exactly. Remember, the angels desire the things that we know, right? They desire these things. They're not the same as us. They, they, there's always a wonder with angels as to what humans and how they get this or why, did, why are they doing it that way? They don't fully understand. So there's this always this curiosity, but they won't worship the same way we do. Right. It makes total sense. And they called him Jehovah. Right? I think that's what they said. And they called it the Garden of Eden because they were told that this place was Eden. So he records it even as Norsemen, they're recording it as Eden. And it's where? It's at the North Pole below. It's, oh, when we understand this with the revelation, it's unbelievable now. Worshippers of Odin and Thor, if they were trying to twist the story to you, not say they found Asgard and Odin and Thor, or a people that worshipped Odin and Thor. No, they found, in this place, a place called Eden, and this people that were there, the inhabitants, worshipped Jehovah. That's the direct name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. Now, that's what makes this, to me, most interesting. Because, see, the United States government did not have anything over Olaf Jensen's head, like they did Admiral Byrd. He wasn't an American, and he was on his deathbed, and he said, here, you can have the story now because they can't do anything else to me. And still on his deathbed, he was still a worshiper of Odin and Thor, which is sad. But I think it actually lends credibility to the story that this wasn't Christian bias. You hear me? This is why, again, I'm telling you, I think you have a legitimate story. Now, I could go in this. He talks about the conveyance. Let me go, let me go back here. Now, and we need to read. He said, because I got something for you. I, got to, I, got, I may just get to this, this one last point because we've got to find out what chariots are, all right? He says here that um, after we've given an account of ourselves to the emissaries from the central seat of government in the intercontinent, uh, my father had in his crude way drawn maps, da 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 shown divisions of land. He says, we were taken overland to the city of Eden. So this is when they go, and they said they were in a conveyance different from anything we have in Europe or America. This vehicle was doubtless some electrical contradicts, and it was noiseless. Uh, it ran on a single rail in perfect balance, so some type of maglev technology here. Um, he says the vehicle was doubtless some electrical, and he goes on to the rate of speed. He said that the trip was made at a high rate of speed. We were carried up hills and down vales across valleys along the sides of steep mountains. Um, he says the car seats were huge, comfortable affairs, very high above the floor. On top of each car were, listen to this, high-geared flywheels lying on their sides, which were so automatically adjusted that as the speed of the car increased, the high speed of these flywheels was geometrically increased. So he talks about these things carrying them, and I thought this was interesting because you know, here's a picture of a flywheel. So what is that? Anybody knows anything about mechanics? A flywheel is a what? A <coughs> There's a flywheel, right? This high rate of speed. This is, is a description of what it looks like. But we're going to go into a little bit further as we start bringing this video portion to an end and then tie up <coughs> excuse me, the rest of this. This description of what they were on. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? Well, it's going to get a lot better because you're actually going to see it described in picture, uh, uh, in scripture, and I'm going to show you, oops, and I'm going to show you the scripture. I'm going to show you the timing of that scripture. I'm going to show you what the scripture says about it, and I believe he shares on it too. 
Listen to this. Me making up stuff. All right. Now let's go to Ezekiel one real quick here, and I gotta I gotta do this. We got give me fifteen minutes, and I'll, I'll try to get through with this part. I'm not gonna get near through this. All right. But this is important right here. All right. It says, uh, this is Ezekiel 1, it came to pass in the 13th year, fourth month, he's by the river Chebar, the heavens are open, he saw the visions of God. Verse 4, he says, and I looked and behold, when these visions began, he's in Babylon, by the river Chebar, he said, where did the visions come from? Out of the north. Out of the north came, what, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, a fire enfolding itself, and brightness was about it, in the midst thereof the color of amber, and out of the midst of the fire. And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. Where did they come from? He says, out of the North. Out of Why the out of the north? North. Okay. Out of the north. He goes on <clears throat> into uh, Ezekiel ten and so forth as well. I believe you're you're getting the picture here, right? Uh, he continues on in Ezekiel. He goes on into Ezekiel ten and talks about it some more because as you saw that that image of that flywheel is what it's a wheel within a wheel. So he goes on to talk about the wheel within a wheel. We've all Everybody, we've all gone into Ezekiel 1 and just said, oh my goodness, if that doesn't sound like what we've been told a spaceship looks like, then I don't know what is. You see, but it's so hard for our minds to wrap around it as Christians because we've been told by the outside world that these are beings from another planetary system <coughs> and these are bad guys and they're checking on us and one day they'll invade and you see, it, it, we've been we've been duped. There is the spirit world, but there is another thing taking place on the earth, in the earth, under it. And when the time comes, the Lord is coming, and we've known it. But now we get to understand the portion about what it's going to look like. We're going to be able to understand what it tells us to, to, to get a visual in our mind's eye to really grasp and prepare our hearts for what's coming. Let me take you to this now. We're done with the video portion now. So where are we? Where are we in Revelation chapter 12, three hours into this teaching? blowing everybody's minds and to to realize and to be strengthened in the understanding of what's coming where are we we're still right here <laughs> right we're still right here this is the coming of the lord this is all about the coming of the lord at the end of the sixth year of seals well let me show you something else how about second kings let's go to second kings chapter two and show you something <laughs> wildly powerful which is pretty much the very reason i wanted to share this with you as well as wrapping your mind around what scripture to says what the apocrypha says of where the mountain of the lord is coming from to understand what we're going to witness coming at the end of seals so that you can grasp what will be taking place later when it comes to trumpets. There is no doubt <clears throat> by the end of the sixth year of seals, the world will overall essentially submit to the Lord to one extent or another for a while. Imagine what they've seen coming. Well, let me share another one with you. What about Elijah? Because this portion of Elijah is representing what? The remnant workers. The, the John the Baptist that are the Elijahs of the is to come. That Elijah company, the remnant bride portion remaining to serve the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And it came to pass, as they, uh, uh, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Let me show you something before I break it down. Let's go to the revelation of the seven churches and the incredible timing that the seven churches have been revealed in here. 
what did I explain to you earlier Sardis was? Sardis represented the seventh year, right? The beginning of the seventh year or represented that period of the seventh year of seals. At the end of Thyatira, there he was coming. He's going to rule with the rod of iron. It's before the rapture. So we know it's his coming right at the end of the sixth year. And Sardis represents that seventh year, the reformation, the, the people coming from the church now into the truth, being with the Lord, the great multitude rapture. And it would be the period of Israel's kings, which is why it was so important to see what we saw in Psalms 48. Right? He's coming as king, the city of the king, which is the mountain of the Lord coming from the north, which is paradise. Well, what's the reference? <clears throat> What's the reference, brothers and sisters? It's Second Kings. Who do we know represents those working as Smyrna, as the Elijah types, serving during seals to when the Lord returns on heavenly Mount Zion, and its reference point in the Old Testament is Second Kings. When the Lord is coming with heavenly Mount Zion, this massive looking mountain flying through the sky and elijah the elijah company who didn't die but will make it through to the great multitude rapture what's the picture of when he was taken in a chariot right when the great this chariot when when the mountain of the lord heavenly mount zion is coming so that he could receive his people unto himself at which point the prophetic type of Elijah is taken up in a chariot. The chariot is called also a vehicle, right? A wagon. Remember, they called it a chariot because that, that's what they knew a vehicle was in those days. But he goes on to talk about in this video something that I had never, ever looked at before because I had no idea what it meant anyways. The upper millstone, brothers and sisters. This chariot that Elijah went up in had the resemblance of an upper mill stone. I had never, ever looked into this before. You want to know what an upper millstone looks like? See these things? See all this millstone, like a flat circle with a circle in the middle? Well, check this out. This is a picture of a full millstone. Check it out. A is a hand mill complete the b section this part right here is called the upper millstone this one's the lower millstone this is the upper millstone look at that it said that elijah was taken up in a chariot that resembled an upper millstone brothers and sisters i hope we're ready I hope we are ready. <clears throat> I promised you that you would get a, a picture in your mind's eye, that you were going to comprehend what it is that we are going to be a part of witnessing by the time we get to the end of seals. We've been told it's going to be a, 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 the aliens coming and they're going to take them. What about at the end of seals? Is it? quote unquote aliens because that's what the world's been taught they're going to think this is a whole alien thing coming it's all angelic fallen or good and the lord what is he going to do what is he going to do once he comes he sealed the 144 and the great multitude rapture happens we know he's making a covenant remember do you now understand how the Lord is going to be able to make a covenant with all people? Just picture now in your mind's eye the picture that has been given to you. <clears throat> he is now coming to make his covenant with all people. Here we are in Psalms 25. In Psalms 25, look at this. If we go into our chapters to years, Oh my goodness, look at that. Another perfect match. Psalms 25 being the seventh year of seals. Psalms 25 in the seventh year of seals. You know what that is? I've, I've explained it many, many times. 
It's chapter 8 of Revelation, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. This, brothers and sisters, right here is this silence in heaven, this about half an hour, which represents that remaining about five months of the seventh year of seals. When the Lord himself will now make a covenant with all people. Does it now start to make sense? Does it now start to, 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 to sink in for all of us? Realizing what the world will have just been witness to? When he comes the way he's coming? When the Elijah company that are left alive are taken up in these upper millstone looking things? They're not aliens as we've been taught. They are the angelic beings. And the ones for Christ, the good ones, are also what the world would tell you are aliens. Do you understand now how important this is to the remnant group of workers who will be working during seals? Do you understand now how important this is to, to pre-be informed about? So that when it happens, we won't have been all left there thinking that they are the enemy, the fallen angels. We'll be able to discern between the good ones and the bad ones. Do you understand now when the Lord comes, how he's going to make a covenant? In, in Psalms 20, 25, verse 10, All paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. You see? Remember where else this goes? This goes back to Jeremiah 31. Well, of course it does. If Jeremiah 31, verse 8, was the reference to the great multitude rapture, then when would he make his covenant? After the great multitude rapture. Verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Exactly. After the days upon his coming. You see, we've talked about this in Daniel as well. That Daniel, the whole 70 weeks, and then it says what? From the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, which will happen around the early beginning type uh, point of tribulation. Then you're going to have the seven weeks as seven years of seals. And they won't have been able to rebuild. It's not until the second set of seven years. This brings what? About three and a half years. Of which point Messiah is here on heavenly Mount Zion. And they will build the city, the streets, and the wall, as well as the temple. Until Messiah gets cut off. You see? But when Messiah came, we knew he made a covenant, right? The world tries to tell us, oh, we're just waiting for this last week that equals seven years. No, this last week is the final year. This is the 14th year when he returns feet down. And what is he going to do? He's going to renew the covenant that he made at the end of seals to begin trumpets. That he had to break when he got cut off at about mid-trumpets. Look what we see next. Remember this? What happens now when we go into Zechariah chapter 8? We go to Zechariah chapter 8 and where are we? We're in the first year of trumpet judgments. We're in the first year of trumpets. And how does Zechariah 8 start? The Lord is on Mount Zion. The Lord is there. He's no longer jealous for them as he was to the 70 years. He's no longer angry. It's all past tense. And he says, Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. And then as you guys know all of this, right? 
Let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days these, the word, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation was laid, just like Abraham, <clears throat> the foundations laid during seals. And so when the great multitude comes in, when the sand of the sea, like where Abraham is and Mount Zion comes, paradise, and they're all on it, and the great multitude rapture is brought there. Now they're going to start to rebuild the city and the streets and the temple. Because before that, there was affliction where he set everyone against his neighbor, which is, you guessed it, you got it, it's the red horse rider that began the 14 years of tribulation. So now, we go back to Revelation chapter 12. And look at where we are. It says, into the woman uh, fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared. And look at what it says. And he fed her there for 1260 days. Well, if we're at the end of seals and trumpets is now beginning, <coughs> then that means the first seven years of trumpets are represented by the 1260 days. And in these 1260 days, what's happening? There's a war in heaven. In heaven, Michael against his angels and the dragon against his. Remember at mid seals? At mid seals, it was the it was in the it was in heaven. They see the great red dragon in heaven. Right? Above. Now, in the first half of, of trumpet judgments, there's a war in the heavens, right? In heaven. Maybe it'll even be seen because now you know what they're fighting in. Hello. Is it possible we're gonna, that during that time, some of this will be seen in these battles taking place? What else is happening during these 1260 days? The city, the streets, and the temple are being rebuilt. And we know the first four trumpets are taking place. All of this is happening during the 1260 days. If we go to Revelation 11, we see it here. We see, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1260 days. When? After the 42 months. This is now the 1260 days that Revelation chapter 17 says is the is not of the beast because he was killed at the end of seals. They're going to prophesy and do their two witnesses things. We know who they are. I'm not going to go down that story right now, but we know who they are. And they're going to be there for 1260 days, which is about three and a half years. And when they shall have finished their prophesying, what happens? And when they shall have finished in Revelation eleven seven, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and overcome them and kill them. When he comes out of the bottomless pit, right? Well, he's not coming out of the bottomless pit till the temple has been rebuilt. And we saw here in 2 Kings chapter 6, remember this? In the fourth year was the foundation laid. In the 11th year, which is what? In the 11th year would be what? In tribulation, it would be 10 and a half years. About 10 and a half years. So foundation is laid in the midst of seals. And in the 11th year was the house finished. So it was in building seven years. It starts from about mid-seals and only the foundation is laid. In the beginning of trumpets, then the temple is being rebuilt with the city and streets. And it's all done in the 11th year. What is the 11th year? The 11th year is right here. The 11th year is a total of 10 and a half years into tribulation. And so what happens in the, in the 10 and a half year? Well, let's follow the story. Revelation chapter 9. Uh-oh. Thank you, Lord. Revelation chapter 9, what happens? Well, the fifth angel sounds. The fifth angel sounds, and what is the fifth angel? What is the fifth trumpet? The fifth trumpet is the first woe, which means at the end of the 1260, when the battle with Michael and his angels against the dragon and his, and the Satan loses and he's cast down, it's now oh oh for the earth. Right? Uh-oh, he is now cast down and knows he has but a short time. Revelation 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. But, whoa, 
Because when Satan is cast down at mid-trumpets after the 1260, it's the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. Exactly. How much time is left at this point? At this point, you have three and a half years to the end of 14 years. There's three and a half years left. Total. So here he is. The great red dragon is cast down, that old serpent, right? And when he's cast down, uh, where are we? We're in Revelation 12. Um, Second Kings. So in Revelation 9, you now know the fifth, the fifth angel sounding, which is the first woe, right? There's four trumpets. And at the end of Revelation 8, it says, then there are three woes left. So here we are at mid trumpets in the 11th year after the temple has been complete. Who built it? The other witness, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, who laid the foundation, we're told in Zechariah 4, in the fourth year when it was done, that he would lay the foundation and he would be the one to finish the temple, to build the temple. Remember, who is Jesus at this point on heavenly Mount Zion with the 144? He is the high priest king Melchizedek, right? The, the Messiah ben Joseph. And then we know he gets cut off. He gets cut off when Satan is cast down. And what happens? The pit is opened. The pit is opened. So at this point in Revelation chapter 12, when Satan is cast down, it's the first woe. The pit is opened. Messiah is cut off. And he has but a short time. And we now know that this short time begins at the opening of the pit, which takes us back to Revelation chapter 17. Remember this? The beast that thou, saw, that thou sawest was, right, the 42 months, is not from the last year of seals and the first portion of trumpets, the first, right, about three and a half years, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Hello. Was, is not, and shall be. It's when he comes up out of the pit that he goes into perdition. And that is exactly what we have here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, <coughs> excuse me, the son of perdition. Well, remember what happens? When, you, when we restarted at the beginning, right after the pre-trib, we restarted the seven churches. Philadelphia is represented by those, the 144, going out during the first half of trumpets. They're the missionaries. And what happens at the end of the about three and a half years of trumpets in the 11th year? There, there what happens? Israel's removal. The king of Israel has been removed. Messiah is cut off. And who comes forward? It's now the time of apostasy. Because Satan has been cast down. The pit has been opened. The time of apostasy is back when the beast comes up out of the pit. The last portion, the last half of, of trumpets is all about the beast. Satan's going to be here. The beast and the false prophet. Because the beast is now coming back up out of the pit. And he's going into perdition, which means the temple has to have been rebuilt because who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he is God, so that he as God sitteth himself in the temple of God, showing himself, uh, showing himself that he is God. That's the midpoint of trumpets. That's the point of Revelation 12 when he's cast them down. And they're ruling as this Laodicean portion. Until what? Until the Lord returns. You see? We see in Zechariah chapter 11 as well. Remember, Zechariah chapter 11 is the cutoff 
So in Zechariah 11, do we see this cutoff where Messiah would be cut off? Well, we saw it in Daniel. We saw the seven and then the about three and a half years, which is in the 11th year, and Messiah is cut off. What do we see in Zechariah 11, the same year? The cedar of old, the vintage of old has come down. And what do we see the Lord does? He says in verse 11, and it was broken in that day. You see, let's go verse 10. He says, and I took my staff, even beauty, and I cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people. Now you understand. Now you should be able to more clearly discern that the covenant made with all people was clearly by the Lord based on how he came at the end of seals, having destroyed all of the enemies with the flame of his word. With the sword of his word, that flame of his word that destroyed them all. Which is that battle of Zechariah 17 we've covered so many times. I mean of uh, Revelation 17 that we've covered so many times. And in that day, it was broken. This takes us to Matthew, right? The, the deception for 30 pieces of silver cast into the house. It's the same storyline playing out again. And what do we get from Daniel? Remember in Daniel. In Daniel, 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 where are you? Daniel chapter 9. What ends up happening at the cutoff? When Satan is cast down. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, which means there was a war that comes to an end. Well, if we go back to Revelation chapter 12. We see that when Satan is cast down. And he's cast down to the earth and he has but a short time. What does he do? It says, verse um, goes after the woman. Verse 14 and 15 of Revelation 12. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly away into the wilderness. Remember what we read all the way back in Psalms 90 and 10? Where are we? We're at about in the 11th year, at about 10 and a half years in at the we fly away. That's the Revelation chapter 12, flying away into the wilderness at the in the 11th year, about 10 and a half years in, into a place where she's nourished for a time, comma, and times, comma, and a half time. That means one plus two, which is three, plus a half, that's three and a half years. How many years did we have left from this cutoff? Three and a half years. Which means they're taken on the wings of an eagle from in the 11th year, about 10 and a half years in, until the very end of the 14th year of tribulation. So this group flying away on the wings of an eagle will be protected until the end of the 14 years. And then what does it say? And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman. Isn't that what we just read in Daniel? What does he do? He's going to go after them with a flood. And then we saw in Revelation 11, when the pit was open, that he's now going to make war against the two witnesses. This war against the two witnesses is going to last how long? Two and a half years. We know that, right? Because Revelation just told us time and times and half a time is three and a half years. But it also told us that Satan has but a short time. What else did Revelation 9 tell us? Revelation 9 tells us that there's one more year left in verse 27 when the Lord will confirm his covenant, the covenant that he had made earlier that he had to break because Satan was cast down and the pit was open and everything else. So that would mean that this war is going to last for two and a half out of the final three and a half years, which is the period that's called the short time that Satan would have. Well, let's go see where we're told about that. Let's go see. Let's go see. Where is it? Okay. Daniel chapter 12. Okay. We go to Daniel chapter 12, and you're going to get the understanding. You guys know a lot of this now, so I'm going fast through it, right? What do we know about it? Daniel 12, starting in verse 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And we'll go halfway through to verse 7. 
and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time times and a half time and a half there's no end here you guys know this like the back of your hands right which means one two plus a half and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people all these things shall be finished well he's given what two and a half years of the final three and a half years which means he has till the end of the 13th year to bring about all of his destruction and everything he's going to do he gets two and a half years of the final three and a half years what is this 11th year what is this mid trumpets point about 10 and a half years in well you guys all know it well it's matthew chapter 24 matthew's discourse remember what happened at the end of mark there was the false christ and false prophets well when you come into matthews the first half of matthews unlike mark's has mention of false prophets but not of false christs why because the false christ was killed at the end of seals and he doesn't return until what you see the false prophet wasn't killed only the false christ was right the beast was killed and then you have what mid trumpets about ten and a half years in this is the abomination of desolation in matthew when he will stand in the holy place because the pit was opened this is when they now flee into the wilderness on the wings of an eagle and they're there till the end of the 14th year of tribulation and now satan is going to have two and a half years with the pit opened do you now comprehend do you now comprehend what's coming out of the earth at mid trumpets do you understand what's coming when satan is cast down to the earth after having been in a battle with michael and his angels these things are going to be manifested they're going to be things taking place in our earthly eyes visual realm what do you think they're going to be if the lord was coming on this mountain carved without hand and the elijah company is going to be received up into these upper millstone looking ships do you understand how we've been duped we've been all told it's one side but what about the other what about the glory of the lord and how it will be represented in these things on the earth look what happens now this is the mid trumpets they all fly away on the wings of an eagle and he says what verse 21 of matthew 24 for then shall be great tri tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time listen to this no nor ever shall be this is going to be worse than it was in marks because now satan has been cast down his fallen angels with them the pit opened the beast coming back the false prophet there wait the beast is coming back well we just saw it we saw it in revelation 17 we just explained it we just saw the battle we saw when he's come up out of the pit he's now the son of perdition and look what happens matthew 24 verse 24 false christ and prophets false christ are now back on the picture again hello and they're going to continue until what the lord comes as the lightning out of the east and shines unto the west when the lord will finally return this time feet down on the mount of olives not on heavenly mount zion where the others are in protection remember he took them away on the wings of an eagle they're there until the end of the 14 years this is the lord returning feet down on the mount of olives at the end of the 13th year at the end of the 13th year which is what you see in revelation chapter 12 this is kind of this is the end of the story they fly away on the wings of an eagle for time and times and half a time so the end of the story is when satan's cast down and the pit is open it's mid trumpets and it tells you that they fly away on the wings of an eagle till the end of the 14 years but what happens in the remaining part of those three and a half years messiah is cut off war breaks out against the two witnesses 
It's going to last for two and a half years, the war. And when the two and a half years are over, just like we read in Revelation chapter 10, actually, go to Revelation 11 first. And when the two and a half years are done, right? The two witnesses were killed. And then all of a sudden they stand up and what is it called? It says the second woe is over, which means the sec the first the the first and second woe or the sixth uh, the fifth and sixth trumpet are going to last for two and a half years, which is the time while the war breaks out because the war against the two witnesses will last for two and a half years. Hello. All at the time when Messiah is cut off. When they're gone, flying on the wings of an eagle. The end of the sixth trumpet, the second woe, is what? Right before the seventh woe. I mean, the seventh trumpet. Listen to what it says about the seventh trumpet. Revelation 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. So, as soon as the seventh angel is about to sound, which is the start of the 14th year, the, the, the seventh year of trumpets, which is the 14th year of tribulation, Satan's two and a half years and the beast and the false prophet, the two and a half years that they had is over. It's called the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared it to his, unto his servants, the prophets. Remember this? When it should be finished from Daniel chapter 12? When Satan gets only two and a half years, <clears throat> it's finished. It's over. Because why? Because the Lord is returning feet down this time on the Mount of Olives and will fight against them as when he fought in the day of battle in the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of the sixth year of seals. This is now that final battle. This is the Revelation 19 battle when he will throw the beast and the false prophet now into the lake of fire. And Satan is bound for the thousand years. This <coughs> is the end of Revelation, uh, sorry, of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 at the coming of the Son of Man which exactly as it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Why immediately after? Because the seventh trumpet is going to begin to sound immediately after the sixth year. And as soon as it begins to, to sound, which is immediately after, the Son of Man is coming this time. What? Not in, but as you guys know, only Matthew's is the word on the clouds it is when he's coming at the final trumpet and when he's coming it must be also what the day and hour no one knows meaning the final 14th year the lord is coming immediately to begin it at the sound of the seventh trumpet as lightning from one end unto the other feet down on the mount of olives on the day and hour no one knows which is exactly the start of the 14th year when he comes he says as I bring it to a close he says it will be as it was in the days of Noah and when he's coming that's why Matthew is the days of Noah but not Luke not Mark only Matthew's discourse is the days of Noah why because the Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives at the beginning of the 14th year of tribulation and the 14th year is what? In the count of Jubilees, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times seven years. The 14th year of tribulation, when the Lord returns feet down, is the 49th year of a Jubilee count. And you know what that means for those who have been following this ministry for any amount of time. In Leviticus chapter 25, the Jubilee year is a numbering of seven times seven Sabbaths of years. That 49th year and only 
happens in the 49th year. Then shall thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. It is the proclaiming of liberty to the captives. Do you know why? When that 49th year is over, when the Lord has destroyed all the enemies, and it's, it will have been as it was in the days of Noah, that final year is one year and 10 days long. In Genesis chapter 7 and 8, the days of Noah, it says it began on the second month, 17th day of the month. In Genesis, don't worry about the date. That's not the key here. It began on the, uh, the 17th day of the seventh month. And look at when it said it was over. Genesis 8, 14. And in the second month, 27th day of the month. The days of Noah were one year and 10 days long. And what do we know, Matthew 24, at the coming of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives represents the final year as, as uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, when he will destroy all of the enemies, bind Satan. And that final year is the days of Noah year that begin on the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets, to begin that 14th year. It will be one year and 10 days long because in the 49th year, it is a year and 10 days long. And when it's over, the 14th year is over. And on the 14th year, and on the 10th day after it, a trumpet sounds for the declaration of the Jubilee. And what happens? It will have been three and a half years for which those who were sent into the wilderness on the wings of an eagle were gone for three and a half years. And do you know what happens at the end of it? Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 49. Do you know what happens when they come back from the wilderness? Now these are the names of the tribes from the north end to the coast of the way. They're all given their portions of land back. All the tribes will be brought back and they will all receive the restoration of their lands and the promise in the millennial reign. Because if you remember in the Jubilee, what happens when they declare it on the 10th day on atonement, they will all come back from the wilderness and they will be proclaimed liberty and every man shall be returned his possession and you shall return every man unto his family. They will all be returned to their portion of land. And if we go to Psalms and follow the same chapters to years and go to Psalms 133, listen to how it all culminates in that final jubilee. Is it this one here? Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon Mount Zion. Do you know why the dew is descending upon Mount Zion? Because at the end, right near the end of the final year of the 14th year, when the Lord destroys all the enemies, what's going to happen? Water is going to flow from the, the throne in Jerusalem of the Lord. And it's going to replenish. The water is going to renew the earth. It's going to renew the earth. And the Lord will be dwelling in Zion, the mountain of God. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Why? Remember, at the end of the 14th year, they will come back one year and 10 days later, and they will all be restored on the Day of Atonement, all of their lands. What are they coming back on? Mount Zion. They're coming back with paradise, right? They all fled away on paradise. They're all coming back with it. Once everything has been dealt with, they will return 
with Mount Zion there with the Lord for the beginning of the millennial reign. And if we bring it back to Isaiah and we go to Isaiah 65, what then happens at that point? This new heavens and new earth isn't the new heavens and new earth of the end of the millennial reign. It says in verse in chapter 65, verse 17, For behold, I create a new heavens and new earth. This new doesn't mean uh, a new one coming, having destroyed the old. It means to rebuild it. Remember, water is going to go out from Jerusalem, from the throne of the Lord, and renew and replenish the earth. And look what happens. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Verse 20. There shall no more thence an in be an infant of days, nor an old man that has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner being a hundred years shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. It's going to go back to as it was in the beginning, where they will be living hundreds of years old again. Brothers and sisters, this is the revelation. This is the revelation. And the revelation has shown itself. We are right here. It has shown itself to begin right here in the above 14 years. And what you have just witnessed being laid out is the revelation of the 14 years that begin on the day and hour no one knows at the end of 70 years in 2024. Brothers and sisters, this was a mind blower. This was, this one takes some time to understand and accept. But realize, I showed it to you with scripture and we had power already in the revelation from the Did Holy Did you know Ghost. that if you listen Having led us live in Canada and are over the age the of 55 of the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Now we can prepare our hearts and minds and we'll be able to lead others in the understanding of it, not to fear when it's coming. Brothers and sisters, I'm so grateful for all of you. I love you guys. I love your families. I pray for you guys every night. I'm so grateful for for Jimmy, our brother Jimmy, who takes care of all of our website stuff and all the stuff that we just dealt with, with getting it moved and, and, and taken care of for several years. I'm so grateful for our Uncle Jimmy, who takes care of our, of our uh, um, uh, Facebook inf uh, details and posts. For Trisha, who takes care of our Twitter feed and putting, posting, uh, putting the posts on there. For having helped us with the book. For all those who took part in helping us with the book. I still need to update in relation to the 70th year, but we've got all the charts now. We've got the graphs. We'll see what I do there. I thank Petra as well over in South Africa for having helped with the book and for preparing the people there as well. Uh, for all of our brothers and sisters, I mean, I don't want to name all the names. We'll be here for another three hours and 45 minutes. I appreciate you. I appreciate you, reach, appreciate you reaching out to me, for sharing with me, for being a part of the ministry in the forum for sharing with posts that we could pray for each other that we could support our brother Steve in Uganda and help him reach thousands and thousands more in Christ Jesus to to ready them in faith to have them cry out to the Lord and then have him and those with him reaching out to prepare them for this time that's at hand I am truly grateful I have been blessed beyond measure in each and every one of you I'm thankful for all the prayers, for all that have supported us here in the ministry and in Uganda and around the world. I love you guys. I thank you. I am so excited for this season and time. And we know it's not for the death and destruction. It's for the revelation of Christ, for what it means when this begins. It is all for the love of the Lord to bring in his people. And we're going to play a part in that.
and it's going to be wild beyond our craziest imaginations. And I look forward to being a part of, it, part of it with each of you. I love you again. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.